All right. Thank you for joining us. Just giving folks a few seconds to get in and get situated. Uh, here we are once again at our last session for this wonderful conference. So everyone take some time, settle in, um, and get ready for another wonderful session. We're so glad to have you with us today and, and throughout the whole conference, really hoping that everyone is enjoying themselves. And so as folks are settling in, um, just want to give you a few bits of information before we get into the meat of today's session. I uh, just want to remind you that your conference registration does allow you access to the SEED conference, as well as the amazing 60 plus workshops hosted by the NOFA New York Winter Conference. Uh, a lot of those uh, workshops are recorded. You can go back and look at them. Uh, such a broad range of topics and presenters to learn from. Both the Seed Conference and Winter Conference are all in one program, which we will paste into the chat, as you see there. We are also pasting into the chat the community agreements, which you have seen throughout the conference. Uh, it frames the respectful and supportive atmosphere all attendees have uh, the responsibility to create. Please take a moment to review those agreements if you have not already. And as I mentioned, um, you've probably have seen all of those uh, during the sessions to, uh, today and yesterday and throughout the weekend. So uh, you can go to our next slide. We want to take this opportunity to give a big thanks and gratitude and appreciation to our SEED Conference and Winter Conference uh, sponsors. Their fiscal support represents their belief um, in the combined value of community, education, and sust sustainable agriculture. So we are very grateful for their support. Please check them out in the Marketplace part of the social app. Um, show them some love, look at some of their items. Next slide. In Living Color, BIPOC affinity space designed by and for BIPOC participants only. Um, all Black, Indigenous, and People of Color conference attendees are invited to access the In Living Color affinity space facilitated by Amanda David and Mandana Bushi. And to uh, access the space, contact them via email, which we will also place in the chat. Welcome, welcome to the Northeast Community Seed Conference and Celebration. And I can say what a celebration it has been. The 2023 Northeast Community Seed Conference is planned entirely by volunteers and led by Heron Breen. And we're so grateful for all of his work. Uh, in faithful partnership with NOFA New York, this is the fourth iteration of a Northeast Focus Seed event. Again, big love, big ups to NOFA New York. Uh, and for working with the Seed Conference, we are so grateful for their continued support. The Northeast is defined as an area from Maryland through ascending U.S. states crowned with Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Atlantic Canada. And if you are joining from beyond those areas, you're coming from Pennsylvania, South Carolina, uh, Los Angeles, don't worry, you are welcome. You're part of this family as well. The Seed Conference intends to cultivate a respectful regional seed community that learns and grows together and supports each other through joy and hardship. Another way to be part of this regional seed community is to join the Organic Seed Commons. We're going to put that link in the chat. Within the Organic Seed Commons, you'll find various regional seed network groups, and we ask that you join the Northeast Regional Seed Network. And for those who are, who are not in the Northeast, you will see your region as well. Please join one. Um, in terms of our land acknowledgement, you've seen this throughout the conference. We invite all present to use the Zoom chat to introduce themselves and to name the First Nations lands they occupy. And to discover whose lands you live and steward and farm on, you can visit Native Land Digital. Uh, you see the website there. And for example, I am broadcasting live from Pecumtuck land, the land of Pecumtuck people, which is present day Springfield, Massachusetts. In our seed acknowledgement, rather than relegating plants to their Linnean classification of family, we ask all present to consider, consider the families of people that have been abundantly supported by plants through time. Everyone here and their loved ones simply do not exist without the gifts given by plants. And first among those gifts are seeds. 
Without these seeds, we don't live. And something to think about before planting. Every plant has origin in a specific place near or far from here. And many have undergone journeys across the earth and back. And we've heard these wonderful stories. Before planting, take a moment to ask yourself, what do I know of the lands and hands that have shaped and supported this plant? If I have purchased these seeds, do I know where the seeds I rely upon have come from and who has grown them? What can I do going forward to respect this plant, those places, and those individuals, regardless of how near or how far away? And many of us think of seed as something we buy from a catalog. I know we're all looking at catalogs right now. But rather than from cherished plants, we harvest seed from ourselves. The buying of seeds from catalogs or online is a relatively new reality. So take a moment to imagine what it would look and feel like to share seed in a community rather than only through commerce. So thank you. You're um, attending Seed Saving Sunday afternoon. What a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Uh, your host today is myself, Sister Anna Muhammad. I am uh, with NOFA, Massachusetts, and as I mentioned, based in Springfield, Mass. And then my co-host, Lee Ullman. Lee, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee. I'm coming to you from the Hudson Valley, New York, occupied Mohican lands, and I'm honored to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Lee. She is driving a car for us today. And our presenters are Steph Hughes, Bill Braun, Jillian Bishop, Donna Dyrick, Stephen McComber or Silver Bear and Sephra Alexander. And so what we'll do before we get right into it, um, we actually will have all of our presenters give kind of a quick uh, presentation or a quick introduction of themselves. But before we go into that, I wanna lay out what this afternoon will look like. So the Seed Saving Sunday comprises two workshops. Uh, it was morning and afternoon, you're in the afternoon session. So um, this afternoon, we will start with a short introduction to seed saving and seed education organizations with Steph Hughes and Bill Braun. Then Jill Bishop will share the ins and outs of tomato and pepper seed saving. Our second hour will be a deep dive into bean seed saving with seed saver extraordinaire, Donna Dyrick and Mohawk seed keeper and community lead leader, uh, Silver Bear. Our third hour will be dedicated to the seed saving of wild and native plants taught by Sephra Alexander, uh, my partner on the CT NOFA. We will have body breaks every hour so we can all catch our breath and get a drink of water and a stretch. So at this time, I'd like to have all of our presenters quickly self-introduce, starting with Steph. Just say your name, the organizations you're with, and you can just pass it on from there. So Steph, I go ahead and, and let you get us started. Great. Hi. Thanks so much, Anna. My name is Steph Hughes. I'm calling in from Halifax, Nova Scotia, ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and organizationally, I'm associated with Seed Change, uh, a nonprofit based in Ottawa, Ontario. Thanks. Thank you. And we should hear um, from Donna, if you would introduce yourself very quickly. I'm Donna Derrick. I'm calling from Southwest Central Maine today. I'm a long time plant and seed grower, 45, 50, 60 years of it. Um, I love nothing more than playing out in the dirt and the sun and the clouds and the wind and like to experiment with saving everything I can. All right, thank you, Donna. Um, Steph, would you, oh no, you just went, please pardon me. Jillian, if you would introduce yourself quickly. Hi everybody, my name is Jill Bishop. Um, I'm talking to you today from Noko Jiwanong, the place at the end of the rapids, otherwise known as Peterborough, Ontario, where I am an urban seed saver. And then Bill Braun, if you can introduce yourself quickly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm not seeing myself, but I'll just go ahead. I'm Bill Braun. Uh, there I am. Mm -hmm. uh, 
calling in from unceded territory of the Pocasset Wampanoag in what is now Westport, Massachusetts. I'm a farmer and seed keeper at Ivory Silo Farm and co-founder and executive director of Freed Seed Federation. Okay. And Silver Bear, uh, Stephen McCumber, if you would introduce yourself quickly, your name and the organization you are with. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Silver Bear, Steve McCumber. I'm a Mohawk uh, Indian from uh, Mohawk Nation here in Ganawage. Um I've been working with seeds all my life. So that's, uh, I've been planting a garden every year continuously since I've been 18. And prior to that, I worked with my grandparents in their garden. And that's where I learned a lot of, uh, a lot about everything. And um, uh, I worked with beans all these years because some, it's uh, the easiest crop sometimes to grow is beans, but there, there's a lot to it. And um, I'm just happy to be here. All right. All right, thank you. And then uh, lastly, Safra Alexander, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, quickly. Hi, everyone. So nice to be around so many seed friends. I'm Sephra Alexandra from the unceded lands of Pagasset Golden Hill Tribe in an area known as Matchmux, the beautiful land in Connecticut. And I have been running the Ecotype Project for CT NOFA, fellow NOFA. And we'll be talking about our work to safeguard the wild seeds and rewild our corridors with the plants that have been here. So looking forward to everyone's talk. All right. Well, with that, uh, with no uh, nothing more for myself, I turn things over to Steph Hughes and Bill Braun. Go ahead, Steph. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move into um, a screen share um, so that I can share my slides. Can you see those? Seeing a white screen right now. Oh, shoot. Okay. Let's try that again. How's that? Perfect. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks everyone um, for having me. Um, as I said, my name is Steph Hughes. I'm calling in from Nova Scotia in Atlantic Canada, uh, where I'm a program manager for an organization called Seed Change and a program called the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. I'll tell you a little bit more about our program in a couple of minutes. Um, I guess I'm here to just give a kind of very brief overview of some CD resources um, that you might find helpful as you continue on your journey of learning about seeds. Um, you know, I find that uh, if you type something in, I'm a beginner seed saver myself, you know, into Google, how to, how to save lettuce seed or seed saving tips, what you'll find is that the internet is just chock full of blogs and YouTube videos and websites and social media platforms that will, you know, kind of compete for your attention on this subject. And it can be hard sometimes to figure out, you know, what is the going to be the most reliable or digestible information or the most accessible for your purposes. Um, by contrast, if you're a little bit more advanced, sometimes there can be too few resources. So I'm hoping in these few minutes to just kind of clear some of the noise and point you to a few, few very solid um, sources of information um, from, from organizations that have been helpful to me and the people that I work with um, that will get you off to a great uh, start no matter what your context is. Um, so for those of you who are coming from uh, kind of a farming or a market gardening context, um, saving now or hoping to save seed on a commercial scale, uh, whether to sell to a company or to be self-sufficient, you know, with, with a certain volume of seed. Um, there's a couple of programs I want to point you to. Of course, the first is the Organic Seed Alliance. Many of you have likely heard of OSA. Their websites uh, are there. And I heard Anna give a shout out to the Organic Seed Commons earlier, which is a wonderful space to have really um, vibrant and often quite technical conversations about seed saving and plant breeding. Um, they work across the United States for a primary audience of commercial seed savers, and they do um, research and a lot of really wonderful work to kind of synthesize policy information in the States. They do varietal development, um, and they do a lot of education in addition to their conference. So um, if you're aware of OSA, you know, consider this a reminder to utilize them because their website is just really chock full of resources that will be helpful. Um, on the Canadian side of the border, 
Um, if you are engaged in saving seeds on your farm, or if you want to be kind of, if you aspire to be doing that on your farm and adding that to your farm uh, activities, um, the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security is a program that's been around for about 10 years. I've been with the program for that time. Um, and we work specifically with folks uh, who want to increase the quality, quantity, and diversity of seed that's grown in Canada. So we've collaboratively with lots of organizations across the country created lots of high quality training and education resources, YouTube videos, how to manuals, uh, we run variety trials and we support other on farm research programs. Um, and our regional programming there's kind of five main regions that we work in across Canada. Um, and those programs all offer kind of tailored resources to the folks who are living and working in those places. So it could be, you know, mentorship, field days, conferences, um, seed marketing support, all of that. So you can check us out at seedsecurity.ca. And being in Canada, we're a bilingual program. So if you speak French, you'll find us at, at our French website. Um, so where today is kind of more about beginner seed savers, I'll spend a little bit more time on resources that might be helpful here. There's nothing about these organizations that preclude more advanced growers from participating, but they're very friendly and accessible um, to folks just starting out with seed saving. Um, so the first organization is Seeds of Diversity Canada. Their website is up there. Um, in Canada, Seeds of Diversity is really our oldest and most established seed organization um, for the preservation of seed diversity. So they manage a huge collection of seeds based in uh, Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, they do mail order seeds the, and, and support a vast network of seed swappers in Canada. They support CD Saturday events and they host sort of seasonal seed saving challenges for growers. So this year their community grow out program includes opportunities to save and share dwarf tomatoes and beans, two of our favorites. Um, and also you could join a project to collaboratively breed an upright ground cherry, which I think is super cool. So you can check them out at seeds.ca or semence.ca if you are French speaking. Um, membership is free and joining kind of gives you access to this very vast network of Canadian seed savers and sharers who are working with seeds that you might not be able to find anywhere else. They also have a great resource called the Ecological Seed Finder, which is seeds.ca slash seed finder. Um, and there you can search by crop variety and by organic status and by region of availability if you are in Canada. So it's a really rad resource if you're trying to track down something that you know by name, but you're not quite sure where to find it. It's, a, it's an up-to-date index of every uh, seed company in Canada. So that's a really cool tool as well. Um, much like OSA, many of you joining from the state side will have heard of the Seed Savers Exchange for sure. They do very similar work uh, in the United States, the Seeds of Diversity. Um, in addition to loads of educational resources and an annual conference, um, they do seed and gardening workshops. They maintain a conservation garden in Decorah, Iowa, and a collection of over, I think, 20,000 rare and open pollinated varieties. Um, so you can buy seeds from their store. They will often contribute free seed if you have a community project. So that's something to keep in mind that you can always reach out if you're in the States to Seed Savers Exchange to ask about seed for your seed library or for your you know, elementary school class or whatever your work may be. Um, and they are also the hub for the exchange where thousands of members across the States um, share and swap varieties of seed that you might not find anywhere else. Um, they don't even call it the seed exchange. It's just the exchange. That's how well established it is. Everyone knows it's about seed. So you've likely heard of Seed Savers Exchange and if you haven't, you know, check them out because they are chock full of wonderful resources. Um, the last sort of website I'll tell you about is the Community Seed Network. And this one, I'm actually gonna take you on a little bit of a tour of the website if I can get my screen share to <clears throat> work for me. But this is an online platform that was launched in 2018 um, to help connect seed savers and also those engaged in community seed saving projects. So um, seed saving <clears throat> uh, gardens, uh, community seed libraries, community seed banks, seed exchanges and CD Saturdays, all of these kinds of community seed sharing activities that have been popping up everywhere for over the last, you know, couple of decades. Um, we wanted to create a space where folks could come together and find each other and share resources and share stories and share seeds. And so the Community Seed Network was kind of born with that mission to connect, share and learn. 
Um, it's fully English French bilingual and this past year in 2022 we added sort of a Spanish facing web page, mostly sharing uh, resources from our friends in Europe and Latin America, um, but it's chock full of great stuff um, to learn so I'm gonna try to take you through it for a minute now. Let me see if I can do that elegantly it's probably not going to be elegant. Okay, I'm going to stop and then restart a share. How does that sound? Okay, so perfect. So I brought us right to our map page because the map can be a little slow to load and I didn't want us to be in limbo while we waited for that to happen. Hopefully you're seeing a map of the world and you'll see that there are people from all over the world who joined the Community Seed Network. Joining CSN is totally free and it always will be. Um, as you can tell from your screen where we have kind of our red hubs is where we have our greatest concentration of members and this does reflect kind of our our mission areas of Canada, you know, modern day so-called Canada and the United States. Um, so, you know, as you zoom into the map, those numbers get a little bit more spread out, a little bit more dispersed, and you can really zoom in with a fair bit of accuracy on an area that you want to connect with people. And you can see sort of who has joined from your neighborhood. Um, just below the map, there's a complete directory. So every, um, Every point on the map is also shared as a directory link. And you can see we have just a little under 2,300 members. So we're growing lots all the time. And this map is one of those resources that the more people join it, the more effective it is at connecting people. So um, if you haven't put yourself on the CSN map and you have a community seed project or you're an enthusiastic seed uh, saver and you would like to meet others, please feel free to create a profile for yourself you'll find in the profile creation um, portion of the site, you can also specify if you would like to be a mentor or if you have resources to share and you can let people know how to get in touch with you if that's the case. So it's also a great place for you to find mentors. Um, and as a point of interest, you also, your exact address won't show up on the map. So if you're an organization and you want people to find you, you can have your exact address show up. And if you're a, just a private citizen, the, the, the tool will kind of scramble your location within a postal code or a zip code in order, you know, the people don't just turn up on your front step. Um, so that's kind of the map component of our website. Um, we have a share component as well. I don't want to take this off the site, so I won't click on these right now. But sharing ideas takes you to our Facebook group. So for those of you who are on Facebook, um, you should definitely consider joining the CSN. It's a very vibrant space uh, where there's lots of conversation and lots of excitement about seeds um, and community aspects of seed sharing. And if you want to share seeds, this link will take you directly to Seed Savers Exchange's um, seed exchange. So if you're not already a member, one sign in will um, allow you to join both networks, the exchange, and the CSN. So there's a nice synergy there. And you know, once you're connected to the exchange, the possibilities are really limitless in terms of what you can find. Um, finally, my favorite part of the site is really our learn component. So there's lots of different kind of categories here. I like to think of them as two headings. One is seed saving resources. So if you're really looking for how to save seeds, you know, we've got crop guides, we've got basics on flower botany and fruit botany. We've got, you know, um, different resources for biennials, for outcrossers, uh, for self-pollinating crops. So you can find lots of great stuff there. And then we also have organizational resources. So this is where if you have an interest in starting um, a community seed project and you're not really sure where to start, loads of people are already doing it and have resources to share. So consulting folks in the Facebook group is a really solid way to access resources and knowledge. And then we also have some, uh, some, some publications that kind of take you through it as well. Um, so whether it's a seed garden, whether you're a teacher and you're looking for curriculum tools, um, or whether you want to start a seed library, you can really find a lot of great resources on the site. Um, those are free to share, um, download, all that stuff that doesn't cost any money. Um, and, you know, as co-chair of the Community Seed Network, I would really welcome you to come and check us out, get in touch with me. Um, you'll find my contact information on the website if you have any questions. Um, and I hope that you'll join us um, because it's, uh, it's, it's becoming quite a thriving space and we exist to support um, beginner seed savers. Um, 
So I just wanted to share that with you. I think that's all I have for now. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention and I'll pass things over to um, Bill Braun from Freed Seed Federation. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, that was a lot of excellent information. Uh, so like I said, my name is Bill. I've been invited to speak a little bit about our organization. Um, I don't have slides and I will keep it relatively quick, but just to give you a little idea of who we are and what we do as part of this seed community. Um, we are focused on the preservation, adaptation and breeding of plants for the public domain, issuing all forms of intellectual property. Um, we also do education and outreach. We hold a seed school series locally to us in the south coast of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, we do on-farm workshops, field days, and then via partnering organizations, um, we work with school gardens in neighboring New Bedford throughout the New Bedford educational system, K through 12, and also with the incarcerated throughout prison gardens in the greater Boston area. Um, just a brief history of how Freed Seed Federation got started. Uh, since I became a farmer as a vocation, I have had a love and enamorment and kinship with seeds. Seeds have been among my greatest teachers. And my foray into uh, farming professionally was commensurate with scratching the surface on the state of things, which need not be said to this group. Um, recognized very quickly and keenly that seeds need help and need our care and have taken us this far and it was on us to fulfill our obligation. So um, my partner and I started a market farm uh, uh, built around seed. We uh, had some pre-existing relationships with restaurants in the Boston and Providence area and used them uh, originally uh, as a financial catalyst for building a garden around seed, building farm operation around variety trialing um, by regional adaptation and preservation and having a fiscal outlet to be able to support that without becoming a seed company proper. Uh, it only took a few years with that model to recognize that the way in which we were engaging with the seed work constrained by uh, commerce and uh, the myriad demands of a market farm um, were doing the seeds a disservice. And so we were encouraged by peers to pursue 501c3 status, which was granted to us in the fall of 2017. And um, I had a lot of resistance to that originally, recognizing that um, the, the trappings of the nonprofit world often mean someone in an executive director role is spending as much or more time uh, fundraising behind the desk and doing outreach than actually out in the field. And uh, my hope, our hope was to spend more time with the seeds and more time out in the field and more time partnering with uh, peer farmers and growers um, of all ilks and backgrounds and visiting their farms and gardens and, and helping them care for seeds. So uh, it, it's turned out that the 501c3 model has been enormously advantageous for us. We are a small potatoes organization. Our focus primarily is in our region of uh, Southeast Southern New England, um, but uh, we're partnering with farms uh, throughout the Northeast. So we're not limited to Massachusetts and Rhode Island in the work itself. Um, so we endeavored to uh, pursue 501c3 to extend the work we were doing on our farm that we lease beyond the boundaries of the farm itself. And by putting a pin on the map, uh, we quickly recognized we were joining a mosaic of not just people in the Northeast, but uh, people nationally, internationally who were engaged in the same work. And we now had something to rally around and to, um, to create projects and engage new and experienced uh, growers and seed keepers um, in work that we do. So uh, it's grown exponentially in the years that it's been in existence. And uh, we plan to, to stay small and to continue to support the Northeast and first and foremost tend to the seeds themselves. But uh, as we all know here, there's, there's much work to be done and uh, we, strive to continue to approach it with humility and patience, uh, two of the greatest lessons that the seeds can teach us. So we, we have a, uh, well over a dozen projects we're engaged in on any given year. The ones I'm uh, most excited about, just to bring up now, um, we received a USDA specialty crop block grant 
two years ago for the breeding of um, new varieties for organic systems in Massachusetts, and by extension, the Northeast, the technicality of Massachusetts was for the grant. Um, two of the, those that are coming up in the pipeline um, now, which I will put out as a call to anyone who's interested to please contact me. Uh, we are working on uh, an open pollinated field tomato um, with uh, excellent flavor and uh, triple disease resistance. So uh, some years ago, I was privileged to speak with Carol Deppy at Organic Seed Alliance's conference. The last year it was in person, which was February of 2020. And Carol was describing uh, to me her endeavor to um, breed new disease resistance into heirloom tomatoes because she was convinced that within the decade, um, heirloom tomatoes would be uh, extremely challenging, if not downright impossible to grow uh, in many climates throughout uh, the nation because uh, they had not kept up with disease resistance. And we recognized in our conversation that uh, our region of coastal Massachusetts and the Northeast by extension uh, are canaries in the coal mine for this because we already have those diseases for tomatoes. Uh, the ones I'm speaking of specifically are uh, septoria, early blight, and uh, late blight, um, which we get um, like clockwork every single year in our area. So uh, rather than become discouraged about that, there is an opportunity there. And so um, we have partnered up with farmer breeders in Western Mass, uh, Tevis and Rachel Robinson Goldberg of Crabapple Farm, who have done excellent work with tomatoes. Some of you may be familiar with them. And uh, we inherited some of their seed stock that we have been working with uh, now for two years and have several um, very exciting new varieties of tomato in the queue to get out into the world. Um, so we're looking for you. If you're interested in growing tomatoes, please contact me for that project. Uh, the other exciting one is uh, uh, breeding for a new bioregionally adapted chicory for the Northeast. I am a, a chicory and radicchio lover and fanatic. My foray into market growing was growing uh, culinary herbs and salad greens. So I have a long history and love relationship with chicory. And I'm convinced that if uh, nobody knew what arugula was 20 years ago, well, another 15 years from now, we'll be surprised that uh, we weren't acclimated to chicory on our palates more broadly. It is a wonderful plant to, to get to know and to eat and to work with from seed to seed. And so um, our work in that crop was propelled by the wild variation uh, chicory for those who have not grown it um, or have worked with it as a seed to seed plant um, has tremendous amount of variation. It is not experience the same amount of um, domestication as many other crops have. Uh, so there's there's a lot there and there's a lot to work with, but that also means consequently that many varieties, particularly provincial varieties that one would get from uh, Italy or other uh, bioregions um, vary widely uh, with their photosensitivity, their days to maturity, how they head up, um, their, their behavior and attitudes uh, where they grow. And so we recognized that there was a need to serve the Northeast in this. Fortunately, others um, on a much larger scale are also answering that call. The, the most known now being Smarties Bio. Um, Andrea is an amazing breeder who has been working with the Culinary Breeding Network, also with Uprising Seeds, and now um, partnering with High Mowing Seeds as well. So there, there are more options available, but there was obviously a need to, um, to continue to cultivate the diversity of this wonderful crop. And so we are a few years in uh, with several promising um, populations of chicory that we would love to get in the hands of growers and have you work with and uh, get to know and get to love and, and eat all winter and, and, and feel its nutritive healing powers. Um, the, the other main reason we jumped into chicory is, as uh, I mentioned before, a large part of our mission is to, um, to grow seeds for people the people, um, specific people, um, but to resist intellectual property um, without uh, a judgment on intellectual property, as is we recognize that the erosion of the commons, as I'm sure everybody on this conference knows, uh, is of great concern. And chicory is slated to continue uh, in the egregious trend of utility patents with what becomes commercially available down the pipeline. So we are fortunate to be 
tuned into that early on, and it has informed the way we've been approaching um, our own breeding work with that. So those are just two examples of um, ongoing projects we have right now that are grant funded. Um, we have plenty more uh, preservation projects and, and uh, seeds of all kinds that we'd love to share and experiment with with you. So please do reach out or uh, during the Q&A period, I'm happy to answer anything further, but I think that's that's all for me for now. So thank you all for being here and for caring for seeds, and I look forward to speaking with you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Steph and Bill. And Bill, please put a way that folks can reach out to you in reference to those wonder wonderful projects. I do love chicory, so I might be interested in that myself. All right, everyone, we are now moving into our tomato and pepper seed saving with Jill Bishop. And then after that, uh, we will have our body break, our first of our three body breaks. So Jill, go ahead. I give it to you now. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for sharing those resources. Um, I am just going to quickly show a couple slides, but then I'm going to show you how to save tomato and pepper seeds through a sort of, I guess we won't call it, it's hands-on for me, not so much for you demo. Um, so please feel free to laugh at me or along with me if I accidentally dump from it tomato seeds all over my computer. <laughs> um, but I'll share just a couple quick slides here to get started. Um, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box as we go. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on it. If I don't, I'll make sure we sort of round out to them at the end. But if there are sort of common questions coming up, the moderators can feel free to, to, to jump in as well. Uh, so as I mentioned today, we're going to talk about saving uh, pepper and tomato seeds. Um, just I told you guys in the beginning that I am an urban seed saver. So this is a picture of my, my lovely backyard garden in the midst of summer and nice pretty uh, pictures in, in the, the peak of the season. Uh, I'm a big believer in community seed saving. So I've often been a seed saver in a small location. I was a landless farmer for a really long time. Uh, so I really like to do things that can bring people together in the act of, of seed saving, cleaning seeds um, and participating as a community to collect seeds. So one thing that's really fun to do with that is, is the actual collection of, of wet or dry seeds. Um, today, we're gonna primarily focus on wet seeds for this portion. Uh, so those are our tomatoes, our peppers, our cucurbits, seeds that have a, a jelly coat or come within a sort of uh, liquid within the plant and are generally collected right from a fruit when the plant is at its ripest. So when we talk about tomatoes, uh, they are generally self-pollinating plants. So they're a really great place to start if you're a new seed saver, um, but you do still need to isolate your, vari your varieties. So if you have different types of heirloom tomatoes, keep them about 15 meters apart. I'll be honest, I've never kept mine that far apart and they still do seem to keep true to type, but you can use other techniques um, to sort of isolate them as well. If you can, it's good to grow up to about 20 plants of the same variety so that you can get a good genetic diversity. Uh, and I would recommend, if you can, to ferment the seeds when you're going to save them, which I will show you how to do in a minute. The other crop we're going to talk about is peppers. Very, very easy seed to collect. Great for beginners. Um, it is also a self-pollinating plant but you will see that a wider distance can be recommended for keeping like varieties apart. And some oddities can occur a little bit more in peppers than you may see in tomatoes. Uh, there are some differences between sweet and hot pepper. Uh, the hot can often be dominant. So you do really wanna be careful because you might accidentally end up with a hot pepper seed in your crop that you didn't quite realize was hot until the next season. Uh, so for a sweet pepper, we want to keep about 45 to 200 meters distance between varieties and try to plant at least 20 plants. Um, and for a hot, we want to keep up to 1500 meters, which is bigger than my entire garden. So I know that's, you know, an, an optimal goal uh, and try to grow even more plants, about 40 if you can. So just some sort of simple information about those saving of those seeds. Uh, and now I'm gonna show you a little bit how to do that. So if I'm, I'm hunched over cutting off the top of my head, please, please forgive me. Uh, so we'll start with peppers. So I hilariously had to go and buy peppers from the grocery store in order to do this and my tomatoes. Uh, super simple, if we're talking about a sweet pepper. We literally just cut it in half and then we just scrape the seeds out. I wouldn't normally do this by hand necessarily, but I'll 
I'll do it just to show you. You just wanna remove the seeds from all the plant material. So try to remove as much of that pepper and the little white part of the flesh that is in there and just remove all of your seeds. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do, probably something that cooks or chefs have done um, on their own and potentially compost these seeds, but we don't wanna compost them. Get rid of all the plant material and we just have, you know, that's sort of hard to see in there. Um, we want to dry these seeds on a screen to make sure that they got nice airflow flowing through them, leave for about a week or two to fully dry, and then we would store them away somewhere dark, dry, and cool for the winter. If you have a winter season like we do here that you need to keep seeds for. Another really, really simple way of saving peppers is if you have hot peppers. So this is a cool variety that I accidentally crossed my chocolate peppers and my jalapeno peppers. Um, and I got what ended up being a sweet chocolate jalapeno. So odd, um, but it stayed true to type for about five seasons now and they actually dry quite easily. So if you are able to dry your hot pepper seeds, this is another variety I have called Chimeo chili. They can be really easy to collect as well. So you let them dry fully. And here are the seeds in there. And then again, you literally would just crack them open and let the seeds come out. So again, separate from all the flesh, save the seeds from there. Same thing, set them to dry on a screen or somewhere with airflow for a week or two before storing them away between growing. I will say with a word of caution, if you are working with hot peppers, wear gloves. I'm sure anyone that has saved pepper seeds are aware that you can potentially burn yourself quite badly. So if you are gonna be saving hot pepper seeds and you do dry them or you're doing them fresh, wear gloves, wash your hands a lot, make sure you don't accidentally scratch your ear or your nose, which I have definitely done. And I'm sure many of us have as well. So very simple, if this is something you wanna do with kids or people that are new to seed saving, lots of opportunities to do that. Now, if you're doing it at a really large scale, it might be difficult to take every single pepper. So you can use techniques such as using a screen to sort of flush them off of the flesh on a larger scale so that you don't have to take every single pepper and, and personally scrape the seeds off. So peppers, pretty straightforward. Um, tomatoes, also pretty easy. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna suggest doing the fermentation technique, which I'll show you how to do in one second. You can also potentially dry them on a coffee filter, or I have seen people do it on a paper towel. Um, but if you use a paper towel, they'll stick. So these are cucumelon seeds. I probably shouldn't have done on a paper towel because they really do stick to it and it can be difficult to safely remove all those seeds. Uh, if you use a coffee filter, they won't stick in the same way. So if you're gonna do that, you know, you have tomatoes, there's seeds within them, you can simply scrape them out and let them dry. I wouldn't really suggest that method unless you only have a couple of a certain type of pepper or you're really doing it on quite a small scale. What I would suggest is the fermentation method. So everybody, if you've opened a tomato, you cut it open, you see the seeds have this sort of jelly coat on them. So if we're fermenting our seeds, it can remove that jelly coat and it can help our seed store for a lot, lot longer. So if you are a tomato seed saver, you know that tomato seeds in theory last about three years, um, but I've had many tomato seeds that last 10, 12, even 15 years where I see the germination rates go down, but they don't become completely unviable. And fermentation can really help with that because you are able to make sure that the seed is 100% clean and able to store a lot longer. So fermentation is a pretty simple method. Again, I'm gonna do it on a really small scale. If any of you are large scale seed savers, you're probably gonna groan and be like, oh my gosh, I would never have time to do all of this. Um, but for the sake of demo, I'll show you on a very small scale. You just cut your tomatoes, you pick them when they're nice and ripe in your garden, make sure they almost look like the tomato you really wanna have the most delicious sandwich with and then you go ahead and squeeze out the seeds. So very simple, you just squeeze out the seeds. I use mason jars, or if you're doing on a large scale, you can use a big bucket. We'll just squeeze out all the seeds and the juice. 
And you would do this for every tomato that you have of that variety that is ripe at the time. I won't do them all, so you won't have to watch me do all of those. But by the magic of time, I do have some tomato seeds that I saved a couple days ago. So this is about three days of fermentation of them. Um, I, I always joke with people that my perfume is owed a rotten tomato because as an urban seed saver, I have most of these tomatoes rotting in my house all the time. Um, they will attract fruit flies. So you can put a little bit of cheesecloth over top if you have a bigger bucket. Um, or if you can store them somewhere where they're not going to give off that smell and attract fruit flies in your living space, that's great too. You can leave them for about three, five days. It will really depend on the climate, the warmth of your house or where you are saving them. If it's really hot depth of summer, as many of us have when we're saving tomato seeds, they will ferment faster. If we have cooler weather or your house is quite cold or where you're saving them is quite cold, it might take a little bit longer. So let them sit for about three to five days. I don't add any extra water. I let them just sit in the juice that they are. Once you feel like they are fermented, you can give them a big stir. They might start to get a little bit of a head of the mold on top, and then you just add water. So at least for the first time, I like to fill it up fairly good. And you can see the seeds are starting to sink. So that's what we want, good, quality viable seed will always be heavy and it will sink. So we see the seed sink to the bottom, then we simply just pour off the mold or the excess liquid carefully if we're doing this over a sink so that we don't dump it into the drain. Try not to dump out your seeds however you can. And then we would decant this several times until we see the water become completely clear. So you can see the seeds floating, then they start to sink towards the bottom. So we would do this multiple times until we see the water be quite clear and the seeds are sitting at the bottom. If we do see some seeds that are floating, especially if there's still a lot of plant material, we can give it a stir and see if they sink. But if they are floating quite readily, they're not likely viable, they're light, and that means the seed is probably not viable and it's okay to, to dump it off with the seed that you are cleaning. So I would decant this several times again until I see the water quite clear. And then I would take uh, a mesh, you know, if you're doing it in a small, you could have various size of them. And we would just pour the seed out. and have the seeds sitting in our strainer here. We can give it another rinse if need be. Have our seed nice and clean, get off all the extra material. And then I would set this aside on a screen to dry as well. So I use a big screen like this. I have a baker's rack that these screens fit into perfectly. You can put them on here. And we wanna make sure that there's nice airflow, that it's not sitting in direct sun and that we are able to let the seed sort of dry naturally on its own. So, you know, this can be a bit more complicated if you're growing at a really big scale. There are many people who wouldn't necessarily just cut the fruit open and they may fruit ferment the entire fruit because they don't have time to be able to sort of check every single one, squeeze out the seeds, give it the time to ferment. So you could do that, put it in a large bucket stomp on them, squish them out, and let more of the plant material remain, it will ferment with the others and, and rise as well. So simple method, you could set it aside on a coffee filter, more complicated is fermenting, um, but the fermenting is worth it because the seeds will last longer, they are completely clean. So if anybody has ever sort of um, saved tomato seeds, you know when they are quite dry, don't know how well you're going to be able to see that, but they they don't have that jelly coat on them anymore. They're quite light brown, very dry, and are ready to store for some time. When I am storing my tomato and pepper seeds for the winter, I keep them in a paper envelope. You're going to want to make sure you label all the way along. So label your jar when you put it into it. Label your screen when you let the seeds dry, and then label your envelope. If you're like me, you have nightmares of people dumping out your seed varieties and mixing them up. 
because the tomato or the pepper seed won't look any different depending on the variety once you have just saved seeds from them. So you won't know what all the different types are unless you've labeled them properly. So if you're new to seed saving, this is a really great way to start because they're both pretty easy crops to save. They're fun. Um, if we're picking peppers, especially hot peppers, we wanna make sure that they turn to the dark color that they are. So a jalapeno would turn bright red. Whatever seed variety you are collecting, we wanna make sure it has gone fully ripe into the deepest color that it will go. If we were to pick this when it's green, it's very unlikely that the seeds will have time to have fully developed and they'll be quite papery thin and not viable. Once you have let all your tomato or your pepper seeds dry, you can winnow them or use an aspirator just to make sure that all the seeds are viable. So again, heavy seed will sink. If you're using airflow, all the high quality heavy seed will sink and any seed that isn't quite as viable will be blown off with any remaining chaff. So that can be a quality control that you can use after collecting and drying your pepper seeds as well. Now I showed you that you can, you know, cut your peppers open, you can cut your tomatoes open and you still have this fruit, which for me, I think is actually a really great thing about saving tomato and pepper seeds. If you save lettuce seed, you know you let the plant bolt in order to create a flower that produces seed, but the lettuce is no longer edible. It gets quite bitter. It doesn't taste very good anymore. If we save cucumbers or zucchinis, we let them get really massive in the garden. We let them go to the point of almost rotting. They're no longer edible. But one of the really amazing things about saving tomato and pepper seeds, if you have the patient to sort of scrape out each of the seeds or to do a slower process like that, you're left with the fruit. So you could eat this piece of pepper, which is great. Uh, if you have a dry pepper, I've used dry peppers to grind them up and make my own spices. So I would have poblano pepper or jalapeno pepper in the winter to be able to use as a nice natural spice, which is really great. I don't think too many people are gonna be able to sell these tomatoes like this. I don't know about you, but I haven't found a market for that yet. Um, however, I do use them for a lot of preserving which is really amazing. So I make a lot of salsa. So that's my tomatoes and my peppers once I scraped all the seeds out of it and I have the fruit remaining. Eat salsa all winter long, smells like my fresh garden in summer, wonderful. Um, you can make a lot of preserves out of your tomatoes. So I make barbecue sauce, um, ketchup, lots of fun different things. And in the last few years, I told myself that my canning cupboard would have one can for every color. I haven't quite got there, but I did make this one out of my white tomatoes, these ones out of an orange tomatoes, and the red is just a mix of a whole bunch of different heirloom tomatoes together. So I was still able to eat all the fruit and enjoy it and utilize it throughout the winter. For peppers, you can do things like pickled peppers, delicious, nice on a cutting board, charcuterie board or whatever. Uh, and I also fermented some of the fruit to make hot peppers, hot pepper sauce, pardon me. So it is a great opportunity to be able to utilize the fruit and still enjoy it. Um, you know, as seed savers, we love watching the full life cycle of the plant. I personally love watching a lettuce plant grow to flower and enjoy that process. Um, but it is also nice to be able to enjoy some of the fruits of your labor and be able to eat them along the way as well. So those are sort of my main tips on saving tomato and pepper seeds. I'm super happy to ask, answer any questions if anybody has any points of clarity and I didn't dump fermented tomatoes all over my desk. So that's a win. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Jillian. So now uh, we have time for questions and answers uh, up until 3.30. Uh, so I'll turn this over to my co-host, Lee. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get them to our three, uh, the first of our three panelists. So Lee, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Does anyone have any, any questions? You can uh, raise your hand, post those in the chat. Um, and I'll kick us off. Oh, also Steph um, had to jump, but I'm gonna put her email in the chat. 
Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email Steph directly. Um, and thank you also to Bill and Jillian. I sort of just had a general question to, to kick us off because I found all of these, hearing about all your initiatives really, really inspiring. Um, and I'm wondering who inspired you to get into this seed work, if you wanna name and call out anybody. Um, I guess I could start if you want me to, because I'm still on my mic here. Um, well, as Steph mentioned, uh, we're from, you know, so-called Canada and Seeds of Diversity has been a big uh, influence in my life. So I would say um, Bob Wildfong and Dan Jason, who are both pretty famous Canadian <laughs> seed savers, if anybody knows them. Uh, and uh, as many of you would probably say, getting to know Rowan White really deepened my um, love and respect for seed saving. And probably the biggest one is the seeds themselves, as, as cheesy as that might sound. <laughs> Not cheesy at all. Bill, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I certainly echo Rowan. She is a, a leader and uh, a visionary in her own right, and I am grateful to be in her orbit. Uh, my earliest mentorships were, uh, I've now turned into sustaining friendships. So that of John Navazio, who wrote a book that I have right here. Um, which I would add to the recommendations for seed savers starting out called the organic seed grower. He's not paying me to do this. <laughs> um, an excellent resource. It's a compliment to seed to seed and um, the seed garden, uh, two magnificent um, seed saving manuals as well. John um, has inspired so many people uh, who have come and gone through his world um, to focus on organic seed breeding. Um, when one still had to be sort of hush hush about that to be taken seriously. So he deserves a tremendous amount of credit. Also CR Lawn, um, now retired, but um, founder of Fedco Seeds um, was someone who every time I had a question, uh, however big or small or however panicked, he would always take the time to thoughtfully reply. Um, so we had a virtual mentorship for many times that was uh, culminated in person. And he is a magnificent human that I highly recommend. And I would say third that I'm recognizing this is uh, you know, biased towards all white males, but um, influences are influences nonetheless. And Frank Morton of Wild Garden Seeds. Um, I came from growing, like I said, uh, culinary herbs and salad greens. And that was also Frank's background. And so to hear of somebody who was a market grower for many years and pivoted towards um, the breeding work that he's done on farm um, was a template that was easy to me to, for me to follow because of his uh, trailblazing. So I, I give him tremendous credit and I'm appreciative um, for him of that. So those would be my sort of four people I would, I would shout out to. And, and many people in this community and some people in this room as well. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be a part of it. And we all have so much to learn from each other. Agreed. Thank you for that. Again, so inspired by um, all of the initiatives, both of your work. Um, if anyone has any other questions, again, feel free um, to let us know. We'll also have um, some more time for Q&A if something um, comes up for you. Um, and you can always put something in the chat. Um, but sure. hearing... Yep. Oh, you go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, no, no, I have a ahead. quick question. I wanted to ask the group, but you finished your thought. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. Go for it. Go for it. Um, I was just wondering if anybody does it totally differently and was watching me being like, whoa, what is she doing? <laughs> I do it totally differently than that. Um, I know we probably have a, a quite a, a breadth of uh, who is an experienced or sort of new to seed saving, but I'm always curious if, if people have completely different techniques. No one's immediately saying, oh God, girl, I didn't know what you were doing. So that's a good sign. <laughs> You must know what you're doing. <laughs> oh, I, I see a question um, in the chat. Is there a pH we should track when fermenting low acid tomato varieties? You know, I have never gotten that sciency about it. Um, I, I think, and I feel free to correct me, that the lower acid are the lighter colors, like our, our white tomatoes. So this one was a white queen. I've never done anything differently in saving any of my varieties of seeds than what I just showed you. But I'd be super open to, to someone telling me I'm wrong or, or having a more science-based answer on that one. Great, thank you for that. Um, perfect, okay. Sister Anna, not seeing any other questions. Again, reminding everyone, you can, you can always use the chat. We'll have some more mm -hmm. time. 
So all thank right. you, Jillian and Bill. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. So now we're going into our body break. Um, grab a drink, grab a snack, grab a stretch. And we will come back at 335 Sharp, where we will take a deep dive into beans with Donna Direct and with Silver Bear. So um, turn off your cameras if you want. Just get a stretch. We will see you at 335 Sharp. Thank you all.
All right, everyone, as we begin to come back and to uh, get back in, in our seats and settle in, hopefully you had a chance to stretch, get something to drink, get a snack, or take care of yourself. We're moving into another exciting part of our workshop today. We will be taking a deep, wonderful dive into beans and working with beans. So this is where we will hear from Donna Dyrick and Silver Bear, Stephen McComber. So uh, we'll start with Donna. Um, and then around uh, four o'clock, we'll hear from Silver Bear. So Donna, we'll go ahead and turn everything over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, myself and Steve and Silver Bear are going to be doing a deep dive into Bean. I'm going to do, be doing the basic cut and dry, planting, growing, harvesting, and I'll let him get all ethereal. Um, so there are quite a few types of beans. There are your lime beans, your green beans, your mung beans, your chickpeas, your tapery beans. But today I'm going to concentrate on the Fasciolus vulgaris, which is your common quote unquote bean, um, your green beans and your dry beans and both of which come in both bush bean and pole bean. So Green beans are beans which are eaten in the unripe stage. And they are also sometimes referred to as string beans, but newer varieties and newer being probably the past 70 years, um, they bred out the string. So they no longer have the string when you step off the top and pull it down like you would a snap pea or a snow pea. Um, and they come in green and purple and yellow and um, little fillets, which come in all three colors. They come in stripes and flats and all different types of, of beans. Um, all beans are legumes, meaning that they fix the nitrogen from the air into the soil. And they're also called pulses but pulses refer to the dry bean and not all pulses, not all beans are pulses and not all pulses are beans. Beans, pulses can be peas and stuff as well. The other type of bean are called dry beans. And those are beans which you leave on the plant until they're dry and you eat the dried seed or save the dried seed. There are so many different varieties of dry beans and they come in both pole beans and bush beans. And bush beans are probably the ones which you are most familiar with being 12 inch plants. And pole beans can be 10, 12 feet, but must be given support to grow on. I prefer to grow pole beans on metal, quote, what they call graduated wire fencing because they do get heavy and you want them to be well off the ground. That To me, that's the biggest advantage of the pole bean, especially dry pole beans, is in the Northeast, when the bean seed is ripening also comes our autumn dews. So your morning dew lasts till 10 or later. Your afternoon dew is back down on the ground by five. And you really only have that short time in between. And I find that, and of course we've got the rainy season too. So, and I find that the bush beans, if you're not right up on top of them, it can rain and then they all start germinating and that, you know, rain one day, 90 degrees the next day. And everyone, you see little tails coming out of your pots. It's like, eh, well, that's not good. So I, that's why I go for the pole beans because you can just like pretend they don't exist and get to them in late October and they're still dry and crunchy and fun to, to pick and you can hear them rattling around in there. And I will vote well, both varieties for when I'm looking for bean seed from either. I'll shake my plant and listen for pods because they tend to hide. So 
with for green beans, what you're going to want to do is let your first flush of your green bean plant just leave them and then and let them go and get big and fat and filled with seeds. But keep your upper ones picked and it puts more energy into your plant to ripen your good seed. And that way you have the best of both worlds. You get to eat your green beans, pickle your green beans, whatever you do with your green beans. And you also get your seed out of it. They say that, you know, they say six to 10 plants for a population, which doesn't seem like very much to me. So I would recommend a good population of 20, 30 plants. And if you're doing your green beans, you can run a row of, you know, 25 feet and say, okay, the first 12 feet is just going to be for my seed. And then I get to eat the second of them. Um, they really like fertilization. So make sure your ground is warm. Make sure your ground is dry and not puddly and plant your seed. The rule of thumb, thumb is three times as deep as the size of the seed. And of course, I, of course, keep things weeded. You know, that goes without saying. I like to keep a foot apart and bush beans, which to some people seems absolutely absurd, but you're getting the air running through them. And if you think of it, your green bean plant just running six inches from the center of each plant really isn't that much. But some people just like are amazed that I thin as much as I do. But I find that you, in the end, it's very much more productive to thin like that. So once your beans are growing, of course, keep them weeded. That goes without saying. And that's actually my favorite part of gardening is weeding and keeping things weeded the day to day maintenance and it puts you in touch with everything. Watch for ones that are rusting or getting weird molds or anything and remove them. Um, and just allow plenty of air circulation to make sure that your seeds stay dry. As for poles, just let them go. You know, let them climb up that pole, leave a few behind here and there, eat the rest enjoy them. So once they start drying, you're going to want to make sure that they are elevated. Sometimes when they get very, very heavy, I'll run two lot rows of string down on either side of the plant just to pick the whole thing up and drape it over with good old baling twine, which is the stuff that you buy and comes wrapped around hay and you just all I'm into it is for the string. So all that, that stuff inside the baling twine, you just throw it a bunch of animals and get all that good string out of it. And it's so versatile in the garden. So you just keep your seed up off the ground in order to keep it dry. It makes it so much better that way. Um, Good strong poles for your pole beans are important and just to keep them from crashing down when they get very, very heavy or you get that super windy day. And a lot of times it's a really good idea to orient them with your wind. So if your wind comes, your prevailing winds come from the northwest, which is most common where I am, run them east-west poles so that way you have a really good air circulation nothing you do gets good air circulation in the the bush beans because they're on the ground but again run them with good air circulation so that it gets through there and keeps them nice and dry um as far as a variety choose something that you love but make sure it's one that is adapted to your region. Every, but every, every neighborhood, every region has their quote favorite, you know, could be your yellow eye, could be your little baked pea bean for baking, could be a kidney type, could be the little round cranberry types. There's 
so many different types of dry beans, so many different types of green beans, but make sure that it's one that's going to set seed and ripen in plenty of time to make your efforts rewarding because if nothing else, you want to make sure you're rewarded. There are so many different kinds of green beans and pole beans and dry beans. And it's just choosing, choose your favorite, what kind do you like, you know, and just play with that one. Play, grow a couple with some distance. It, they are supposedly self-pollinating, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow them to do that. I'd give them some space in between because under organic growing circumstances, there's so many more pollinators in your life that things happen, they cross up, which isn't necessarily bad. You know, sometimes crosses can be really interesting and half of the fun, and that's how different varieties, you know, which were usually originally sports or however they came to be a different variety and that makes it more exciting sometimes so but do if you are definitely want this one variety give it some isolation distance give it you know 20 30 feet from another variety just to assure you know i rarely see them crossing but i know they do um okay once your plants are dry you're going to hand pick your beans and I usually do it into a paper bag and just set that paper bag aside and that's kind of like a winter sport is sitting around and shoveling beans and lining up the table with bowls because I usually pick them all into the same bag and that way you get like you know six different wooden bowls on the table and you're breaking them into different piles of different beans and cleaning them up and shelling them. And that's half the fun is the sorting. And then just leave them out for a couple of days once you shell them to make sure they're well dried. It's really important that they're well dried before you put them away. And beans have a fairly, fairly long shelf life. And when your seed starts getting old, you'll notice, I've noticed anyway, that You'll have your first sets of leaves, but then your true leaves will never come through. And I find that that's just when my seed is getting older and that'll happen. That's when you save a new batch of that seed. So if you have different seeds going in a rotation, you just have to be aware of years that you've grown it. And I, I will sometimes have three or four years worth of the same seed or, you know, many long, longer than that, but I will not necessarily grow my oldest seed because I want it to have good germination. So your oldest seed is what you throw into the bean pot, grow your nice fresh seed, keep everything looking really nice and fresh and clean, watch for disease. And beans are so easy and so rewarding. And I can't think of anything else I can say about them right now. Does anyone have any questions? And just as a reminder, folks, please put your questions in the chat. Donna, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> <Yeah>. much. <laughs> and while people are thinking, um, you did mention you like the pole beans. I um, must love pole beans. <laughs> I just really, that's, that's my thing now is pole beans what um what what's the best way to keep those through the winter you know i'm in massachusetts those of us are in these colder climes what is the, the best way to keep those i just pick them into paper bag when they're green when they're dry and let them sit in that bag until you know sometimes it's a month or so down the road they're just you know kitchens filled with bags of beans and then I just, when I have one of those days, sometimes it's usually a snowy day, I just stand there and start shelling beans and then just keep them in a cool, dry, dark space. It, as with all seeds, damp and heat is there, and damp, heat, and light. It's like the public enemy number one for any seed. All right. 
A um, couple of questions coming from Ellen and Luana. What is your favorite whole variety? So you got any personal favorites? Um, I really like the cranberry. That's one of my favorite. But I have been experimenting with a bunch of different varieties lately. And I came across one called Sonora. And it sounds like it's really Southwest, but it seems to do really well for me. And it's a, a larger... I guess you could classify it as a kidney type. And it's, I, I, in theory, it's also a green bean as well as a pole bean. And I do have a thing for lima beans, though. I really like lima beans. And there's another one called Doloff, which is a larger, flattish, which is so similar to a lima bean. I just, I just love growing beans. There's these new ones I've grown called Amish Nuttle, and it's almost square. They're so packed into those pods that they're like almost square, and it's a smaller bean. I just, and you put them all in a bowl, and you look at them and say, oh, wow, that is so cool. And you know that you have only 10 of them, 10 different varieties in that bowl, and that there's another, you know, 400 of them out there that want you to grow them and no, not enough time in life to grow all the beans. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marissa has a question. Um, she yes, shell yes. beans before that look just fine. Only there is a thin layer of mildew or dust on it that is easily wiped off. And after they are clean as ever, are those still viable? I do a germ test, you know, but... Yeah, the, uh, back to probably it was a bush bean, and back to our damp northeast autumns. I that that's why I go for the pole beans because I find those they just mold up so easily if you're not like right on top of it. And it seems in the autumn you have so much to do that it's like ah, I'll get to the beans, ah, I'll get to the beans and. Then you don't, and it rains, and they get moldy, and you know, <laughs> the progression of things. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question, Marissa mm -hmm. and Ellen and Luana. Um, if there are any additional questions, place them in the chat. If not, we will have uh, some more time for more questions and answers. And so we can begin to bring on Silver Bear to talk about his experience with beans. Um, so again, if, if there are questions that come up, please use the chat. And then after um, Silver Bear, we'll go into another body break. So Silver Bear, we turn everything over to you now. Hello? There you are. I hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Where do I begin? Okay. In our culture, uh, we have many songs and dances for the agricultural growing season. And so it's always customary uh, when I speak someplace, I always begin with a song and a dance. And since now I'm a politician, I'm really into performing a song and a dance. So this is uh, from the song that we use at planting for the beans. It goes like this. So um yeah that's so really it's uh, it's really um Really honored to uh, be speaking here uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's been a long day. It's been a, a, a lot of uh, long days uh, lately. Um, yesterday I was at a at a seed, uh, uh, I guess a seed sale, uh, mostly organic uh, here in Montreal, and quite a few of the the booths uh, all had different kind of beans. Some of them I were familiar with, and some I weren't. But uh, one thing that's uh, kind of interesting or nice that I can I can remark on it is that uh, there was a time when there wasn't very many uh, varieties uh, offered really in Canada. Uh, that's where I live. I live in Canada. Where we call it the, the Canadian side of the border. 
as you know, we are the people of the Six Nations and, uh, you know, we don't consider the border between Canada and the United States as far as our people are concerned because uh, the border runs between uh, right across our territory and across some of our reservations. Uh, so um, we look at ourselves as being people of this land. And so, and there are also treaties in regards to that, that uh, First Nations people, we have the right to go back and forth across the border with our own personal goods and our agriculture product. So having said that, um, I've been uh, doing beans since, uh, since I've been a child. So my favorite, uh, right off the top, are wax beans, yellow beans, because my, uh, my grandmother grew that. And I guess because maybe that's what my grandfather liked. And I know that when uh, my mother cooked uh, and for my father, she made a big, what we call a boiled dinner, which is basically the, what's fresh in the garden. You see like uh, early August, like early cabbage, uh, string beans, uh, green and yellow, and um, you know, early potatoes. And those are things that, uh, you know, they cooked up. And so my, uh, my grandmother always cooked uh, yellow wax beans. And my late uncle, uh, who just passed uh, this about two years ago or so, and one day when I was visiting with him, I mean, we were just talking about all kinds of things. And then, you know, gardening is part of our way. So what happened is he talked to, and he said the same thing. His favorite were wax, yellow wax beans. And so yellow wax beans are my favorite. So we'll start from there. And then uh, the, at one time, there was a lot of different uh, type of, of, of beans. And uh, just to, to share with everybody right now, uh, this is my book. This is the Bible called Beans of New York. Uh, if y'all some can see that, Beans of New York. And uh, this was mentioned earlier on in the early years when I was involved a lot with the Seed Savers Exchange. And in there, they refer to this, uh, the Beans of New York and the different varieties and so on and so forth. And so I... Uh, I went there. They were at the Geneva Library in Geneva, New York, which is about uh, an hour west of Syracuse, between uh, Syracuse and Rochester. And so I, I purchased this. So this is very quickly to show you the beautiful, I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well. I'm doing everything by my iPhone. But it's just beautiful seed coats. And it's just... Uh, I guess this is why beans itself uh, are so appealing to, to the eye for everybody. We all have, we all seem to have favorites and so on. But uh, one thing uh, I want to mention that she had just talked about to grow varieties that are good in your region. And so uh, two years ago, I grew some beans from New Mexico, which originally came from Arizona, then went to Northern New Mexico. And then my friend sent them on to me. And these were uh, Hopi, uh, Herp, Hopi, purple bean and and I grew a hundred foot uh, roll of it but it didn't uh, it took the entire summer to grow and uh, it just about made it uh, I would say so yes having said that so these are things that uh, we should become conscious of even though you look to a lot of seed catalogs like everybody's doing right now looking at all these things and then um, and some of them are like wow I like to try this and try that. And it's good, you know, it's always good to try different things, but at, at some point you come to a realization that the things that grow well in your area are the things that uh, we should concentrate on, especially today, if you're looking at food security. And what does that mean? It means a lot of things that are happening in the environment, the climate change that is affecting, uh, there's less pollinators uh, out there. And so all these things combined together, if we're gonna come to a point uh, shortly that where we can have to depend on really in what we grow so we have to really count on the things that do very well in our area and we are very fortunate here in the northeast that there are many varieties of, of beans uh, most of our beans that we use for us the Haudenosaunee people are varieties that we just let them uh, grow to maturity and use them as dry beans so we incorporate this in, in uh, corn soup, we incorporate this in cornbread. We do different. Uh, we bake beans. We do beans where uh, we uh, mash them down and uh, maybe mix it with uh, different kind of spices. 
and, and so on and so forth. So beans have a lot, a lot of uses. And in the springtime or earlier on, like usually by July, there are a lot of fresh uh, beans coming on, green and yellow. And so there's a whole like uh, countless varieties. So here, this, this book was uh, made here in Canada and um, first published in 1916. And it's on the Iroquois foods and Iroquois, uh, the foods and food preparation. And so I am uh, Mohawk and we are one of the families of the nations of the Iroquois people. And so uh, this gentleman, Wa, put another, well, this is amazing color picture. So these are beings of our nation. And today we still have quite a, a few of them. I produced a, a bean poster a few years ago and I am in the re, uh, in the production of reprinting it. And uh, because uh, I've collected and maintained a lot of varieties, but some I just came across recently because I, I became friends with some other uh, Haudenosaunee people in Wisconsin and where they carried a, a variety of beans that when they originally came from New York State and uh, went to Wisconsin, like a lot of people, they brought their seeds with them. We always hear about that. And so uh, we always hear about people that migrated from Europe and brought favorite seeds with them. And so our people migrated the same from our territory to another one and they brought their favorite seeds with them, hoping that they would grow well and do well. And so, um, so that's one of the first things. So as you mentioned, uh, beans grow by uh, various ways. There's pole beans that would grow 10 feet, 12 feet in the air, or even taller sometime, where you they have to be supported uh, by maybe saplings. Uh, when I was younger, I used to get saplings out in the in the forest. But now I um, I purchase a lot of uh, bamboo. I go to garden centers and here there's some bamboos that are at least uh, six to 10 feet high and I purchase those. So uh, it's, uh, and I'm able to use it maybe two seasons or so. And then, uh, so it's very good. And uh, when I plant mine, I plant it uh, on like this, like a teepee, a tripod. And, uh, and I usually put between five and seven beans around each pole and um, Sometimes we used to plant them straight up, but if you plant them straight up, what happens a lot of time, the bean will fall into the, along the pole and the vine will wrap around it and, uh, you know, kind of choke it. So when it's on an angle, then it is hanging this way. And uh, one of the practices that we do is the beans that are way on the top are the ones that we leave. We don't touch those, those become our seeds. So everything that we could reach and when your, your grandchildren or kids are with you, they pick the lower ones, you pick uh, the, the higher ones and the ones above your, above your head, you just leave it for the seed. And that's just uh, a practice that we do. And uh, now where am I getting back to? So now the beans grow this way, then uh, so the beans are used as a uh, string bean or snap. Uh, I come from the generation where everybody just call them string beans and people still call them string beans. We're not used to that word uh, snap bean. And then uh, the bean just before it's ripe uh, and full, uh, we use it as um, we call a shell bean like this. Here's a, a beautiful bean that I just uh, received this year from a, a friend of mine in Italy, a very beautiful uh, Bean and I tried them out just to grow them and see what would happen, and they did very well. So I'm uh, I'm pleased about that. I was kind of concerned about day length because, uh, like many of the seeds, it's affected by the length of the day, and uh, like beans that come from Mexico or the salt. I grew some beans one year from Bolivia, and they only started to blossom uh, on the fourth of October. And no way would it it would it make a uh, seed or even a fruit. Uh, perhaps if I had a greenhouse, maybe it would have went on to do it. But that's just to, to show you how these things happen. And so as beans, as the corn and squash uh, travel from the south to the north as with our people, from, from generation to generation, as they move their villages, the, the seed adapted to the length of the day. And so where we are here, in this part of North America, we have a long day. 
as if you go back down to the south, the days are shorter. And so this is the same thing in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, the day is a little bit shorter than here. And so that's why like with growing corn, uh, sometimes the corn will uh, often just begin to tassel after September. And sometimes it makes it, sometimes it doesn't. So uh, th this has to do with the length of the day. Um, not because our season is uh, any shorter or longer than theirs. Uh, they have the same growing number of growing days, but their, their, their lands are divided by two seasons. So when I just returned from Mexico uh, two years ago, just before the COVID started, I asked my friend, I said, what kind of seasons do you have here? He said, well, we have a, a dry season and a wet season. So I said, when do you plant mostly? And he said, we plant in the, in the wet season. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it's raining every day, but it means it's a time or in that season where they will get rains. But in the dry season, it just almost no rain at all exists. So this is how they plant a lot of their crops in what they consider uh, the wet season. And, um, and but the length of the day is shorter than ours. So the next in beans uh, then goes on to dry beans which are like literally hundreds or thousands perhaps of a lot of dry beans and a very good source right away while I remember because I'm getting to be that age where if, if I uh, lose my train of thought I'll, I'll miss it. So a very good uh, source of beans uh, in a reference are the Seed Savers Exchange is uh, wonderful. There's uh, countless uh, varieties of beans being offered by uh, a lot of people and again keep in mind that um, you should maybe consider growing beans that are that will do very well in your area and along with that is um, a place called the bean collector's window uh, run by uh, russ crow out there in illinois and i got to to meet uh, russ a, a few years ago uh when i was invited to iowa uh to the seed savers uh, um, conference a couple of years ago, and I was invited to come there and to identify some of the seeds and seeds uh, that I had uh, originally put in the network in the beginning of the 1980s. So going there, I just, um, you know, I told the stories uh, of the beans that I knew and that I kept. And so there was a time when there wasn't that, that many people that uh, were doing things other than just the older ones. So when you have a younger family, you know, you're out uh, working and, and, and so on. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it all seems to be that way or culturally that, uh, you know, our, our grandparents kind of raised us, not that our parents are not there, but they're out working. And our grandparents are usually the ones that are mostly at home because, you know, they're, they're retired mostly. So you have time. And so that's why I grew up. Uh, working in the garden with my grandfather, and so what my the way my grandfather used to plant, um, he would take a, a handful of beans, and he would put it in his mouth, and then after that he would take the beans and and plant them in the ground, and so that's the way I plant. I plant by putting the seed in my mouth and putting it in the ground. Uh, it's a family tradition, I guess, and uh, some time ago. I was at a little seed uh, conference and a cousin of mine was talking and he mentioned the same thing. He said, well, when I plant, he said, I put the seeds in my mouth and then I plant. And so then I realized that we both have the same great grandmother. So in the family, I guess that's something that, you know, and where my great grandmother got it from, probably her mother and generations back. But that's uh, uh, our human connection our physical connection uh, to the beans and the spirituality and the connection of that and putting the, the seeds into the ground and, and we plant that way. And so um, about seeds in the distance, when I plant um, beans for drying, I plant a lot of uh, bush beans. You have to keep a lot of space in between it. Uh, on the average, at least three foot between your rows or four foot, it's even better. If you have that opportunity, give them four foot space and I, I plant them about a foot apart, but I put three seeds in the ground where I'm planting by a, about a foot apart like that. And, and I plant east west because the wind here travels east and west. And the reason for that is because when there's a lot of dampness 
or it's wet a lot because it's raining uh, for several days on. Uh, the D, uh, if they're too close and uh, they don't have the air to circulate, even though it's moist, it'll, it'll dry off the dampness and ward off the disease from becoming a uh, disease. I learned that sometime in the hard way, long time ago, where I had them too close, and then we had a period of wet, and then the beans got all that like mildew on it, on the plant, and they were totally no good and were unusable. So those are just uh, some, you know, uh, some uh, growing practices uh, with them. Uh, I always urge everybody to try to grow different things and find things that are your favorites. It's really hard to say what is my favorite because I have so many different beans. Uh, they're all used in, in, di in different ways. Uh, some of them, we did have a, a bean tasting test a couple of years ago at a seed conference at Tayendanega, which is a Mohawk uh, uh, reservation which is just about 30 miles west of the city of um, Kingston, Ontario. And while we were there, um, they took a few of our beans and they soaked them overnight and then they turned them into a bean dip the next day, but without flavoring it, might uh, to tell you. So they were there and they were just smashed down. And so, and we tested them by um, just how they tasted. And so the one that came out the the top for for us there was a uh, and there, there was three or four beans there was a local bean that they call potato bean uh, which they incorporate a lot into their corn soup and th this did all right but this is the bean that did the best it had the best flavor as a dry bean and she mentioned it a while ago well, well we just call them cornstalk beans or Seneca cornstalk beans she just said it was some kind of Amish bean but the Amish people got it from us. So this is one of our beans, our variety. And it had the best flavor of all. I think there was four beans that were tested. And then we tested another bean called Mother Earth bean. And then we did an, uh, like um, a kitty type. So they all taste good. They all have their own merits. But uh, the one that had the overall in the flavor as a dry bean. And it's an excellent bean to use uh, that you can use as a baking bean. You can definitely use it as a snap bean when it's just beginning. They're very short, about maybe four inches long, and they're tightly packed. And it's a really, really nice uh, flavored bean for using early. And then uh, and then to use as a dry bean in any way that you like to do dry beans. So among our people, we use a lot of beans and soups. We have a you know, we're kind of basically a soup culture uh, using the various type of corns. The most popular is like we use a white uh, white flour corn or Tuscarora corn that we make corn corn soup with. And we make this by washing the corn in wood ashes and then going into the production of making soup. Or we grind it up and make flour and incorporate beans again. And so, you know, being full of beans, um, there's all these uh, different varieties that we try to incorporate and still keep. And another thing is that uh, looking through seed catalogs, even uh, maybe 20 years ago, there was a company, it's still there called uh, the Vermont Bean Seed Company, where they offered a lot of different varieties. And now a lot of them are just gone, fallen by the wayside. And some of them were really, really, really good uh, varieties of beans. But, you know, uh, the reality of it is, you know, uh, these things are, controlled by these big corporations. So, you know, when you really get to understand, uh, we're, not in, we're not in control of our own destiny if we don't plant the garden ourselves and maintain these heirloom or heritage varieties or, fam, uh, or things that have been in your family for a number of generations. You know, it's dictated to us by these large companies. They control the seed, they could take the seed away and, and, uh, and then the, they disappear. Uh, many of the wax beans are falling by the wayside. Um, the golden wax, the old-fashioned golden wax or golden wax and proof is a very uh, fine wax bean. Another very fine wax bean is brittle wax. And then there's the kidney wax. And they're all varieties uh, <clears throat> of, uh, of beans. Uh, and then uh, I have some old, old catalogs. I collect, that's one of my hobbies. I collect a lot of old seed catalogs and some of the early ones in the, the 1940s that have a whole listing of uh, uh, 
wax beans. And in there, so there's unrivaled wax that you can get through the bean collector's window, rust proof wax. Um, uh, Shore crop is another one. I still have seeds of those and I grow them out every other year just to maintain a good seed and that would have it. So, um, and, and some of the modern varieties of wax beans that I find that it's really, that's really good is a, a new wax bean that it's called Monte Cristo. I think that's the name it's called. It's very fine, fine, uh, like pencil long wax, uh, wax bean. And I, I found it uh, very good as a young snap bean. And, but the other thing, I was just commenting about this yesterday when I was at the seed conference, I was talking about that uh, with one of the one of the persons there, uh, and I was talking about this bean. And I said, one thing, it, it seemed to lack a little bit of flavor, but I said, it's, it's wonderful that it, it lends itself to absorbing whatever you want flavor with. Mostly in, in those stages, you tend to put lot of butter on and a few sprinkles of salt or something else. So beans also to different varieties. Some of them have unique flavors and some of them al allow themselves to absorb other flavors. So when they're baking beans, especially you see like a lot of light color beans that are very good because they absorb the flavors of what you mix with it and bake it. And so the traditional way of doing beans is baking them in the ground. And Boston is known as, uh, you know, the bean town. Well, the history of that is that they put, they did a lot of uh, beans at one time where they learned it from uh, the Algonquin Indians or the natives that are in that area. The family group is Algonquin, which is uh, Passamaquoddy, uh, I think the Abenaki, uh, Penobscot. Those are all in that family group. Our family group is Iroquois, which are Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, and Cayugas, Senecas, and Tuscarora. And they are our, our neighbors. But we all live here in the Northeast. And so because of that, some of our beans are the same as each other. And because there was a lot of inter, you know, intertrade uh, with each other in our communities. And sometimes, you know, we like to say, wow, this is ours and that's theirs. But it's all of ours together, and we always maintain the thing by planting and sharing. And here's another very fine old-fashioned bean that, uh, you know, now it's called Chester. But in our language, it's called, uh, it's just called skunk. If you translate it, it, it's skunk. In our language, it's called onita. And the only reason it's called skunk bean, it's because it has a color pattern of a skunk. You know, that's all. And so a lot of things are just uh, described by what they look like. Uh, I know the, in some of the beans, they refer to them as goose beans. And the reason they're called goose beans is because what happened is there was a time when people had to hunt uh, to eat. And often uh, they, they, uh, they shot goose. And what happened is they, the goose would eat beans and they weren't digested yet. And it, while they were cleaning it, they found these beans. And some, the same thing with a turkey craw, they found uh, some beans in the craw of a turkey. So it got this name. So that's where these names come from. They come from that uh, because of uh, the animals. And, and if you come from a time where, uh, you know, there's no grocery stores and your life depended on what you grew and what you hunted, it really was very important. And so maintaining that knowledge why these things have these names and why these things we still maintain and we, we, we add it to the history, the knowledge uh, of our people. And so another thing I just want to say quickly, I think my time is running out, is that when we plant pole beans or like everything else, our beans go up the pole. They go from east to west. They climb this way. So they, uh, they climb counterclockwise. And all the ceremonies of our people, of the Iroquois people, uh, in the lung houses, where we have our ceremonies, all our ceremonies and dances go counterclockwise. So we're one of the few nations where we go counterclockwise. The other Indians, they go clockwise. Um, I don't know. I don't know why, but for us, this is what we do. And, and sometimes uh, some of us will get in a little bit of like uh, discussion or debate about it. And I would say, well, uh, what did your people follow before the Europeans brought a clock here? We follow the sun. We follow the patterns of the stars, which we still do. And it goes from east to west and where it goes counterclockwise. 
for us, what happens is that in the fall, now, right now, uh, the Pleiades is on top of us in the north. And then in the spring, they're going to be going down in the west. And that's the time that we begin to plant. And they'll come up in the fall and they'll be in the east. And that's the time that we will harvest. So all these things, we, we still keep this cultural memory and, and we grow by that. And another thing for growing beans, uh, what I do here is I grow by, uh, by the season. Basically, I can use two months. I can use the month of May and the month of June, depending where the moon is in both of those months. So, um, so the longer season beans, like any beans that are dry bean, like a kidney bean type, uh, those take the longest season, so I plant those first. And those that are need a shorter season, like string bean types, I might plant second. And so I plant them in different areas, and I follow two moon phases to plant my beans to keep them as pure as possible. So those are just some of my own uh, things that uh, tips. I also run my own Facebook page called Steve's Garden Tips, where I I post. Uh, starting any time now by planting by the uh, phases of the moon. So there are four phases of the moon and in each phase is different things that you plant. So right now is the beginning of the full moon uh, tonight and it's a time for root crops or transplanting. And so I have some uh, house plants that I'm going to reposition into larger pots and I'm going to do that now. And towards the, the end of the month when the, the moon is coming back, or the waxing, I like to call the wax on, Mr. Miyagi, you know, that's when I'm going to start the longest would be my chili peppers and eggplant. Tomatoes can be planted in another, uh, in another month. It's too early for that. So I still follow the, the phases of the moon and people say, well, how do you, what about in the greenhouse? Well, we never planted in the greenhouse before, but all you need to do is apply the same knowledge to what you're doing. And the same thing with melons, I start them at least one month. So I start them in the, the, the moon, the phase of the moon and the next uh, full moon, that's when I'll transplant in the garden. So all this is, uh, the, you know, what we call indigenous knowledge is the thing that, that we do. And this is uh, what we apply to where, what we're doing. Um, let me see. So, Here's another beautiful bean that uh, my friend sent for me all the way from, from Italy. And I don't know if you can see it that well. It's a beautiful purple bean and it did very well. So I planted these beans this year uh, in late May. No, actually I planted them early June. Um, and then in October, they were ready. And I think that's for some time you see in the book, they'll say October beans. It's because when they're, they're coming to to be ready. Uh, and another thing I, I always recommend to people is to, to check on, you know, the long-term forecast. So this year, we're going to have a, a dry spring, but it's still going to be cool. The full moon in May is only going to be the 5th of May. So in the full moon, and that's when I would plant my potatoes in May. Uh, some years I plant them at my potatoes at the end of April. And then the beans sometime in the middle or late uh, May. But this year, I may have to plant my beans because of the season. And the seasons are changing due to climate change at the same, same time. We'll be in the, in the beginning of uh, June. So those are other things to keep in mind. Uh, the long-term forecast, you can check this out anywhere on <clears throat> in the Farmer's Almanac. Uh, it's very good, very useful. And, and there's a lot of good information. Uh, there's your neighbors that they that you know, or old folks that you see that have been planting for a long time. They'd be more than happy to talk with you and share with you. And maybe you never know, they may pass down an heirloom uh, variety to you because uh, you just because you showed interest. And amongst our people, that's the way I received a lot of beans. I traveled throughout the Six Nations, which is southwestern Quebec. Central New York State, Southwestern Ontario, and all our communities uh, in the Senecas around uh, Buffalo, New York, had a lot of varieties and some old varieties that still exist 
came from the Seneca Indians because in the 1800s, there was many seed companies in that uh, that beltway around Rochester, New York, uh, to uh, all the way to Pennsylvania. And this is the homeland of the Seneca people. And so a lot of varieties uh, like Seneca bird egg is uh, a variety that came from that time period. Um, bear paw beans or commonly known as um, scarlet runners is another, another variety and countless string beans um, that are maintained by, by our people and our communities. So one of the last beans that I've collected uh, some years ago at Tuscarora was from a gentleman named Jiggy Hill. And uh, I went to visit him while I was braiding corn at Tuscarora and he had two, two beans. Uh, and I only took one from him. Now I should have, uh, I said, why didn't I take the both of them? Because one of them I thought was like, maybe like a commercial variety, like, uh, oh, I don't know, Bountiful or something like that. But uh, the bean that I, I got from him uh, in the end, well, I planted it the, the next year and I planted it by itself and I planted it at my mom's home. And it turned out to be long yellow pods, which I was, wow, really surprised. And then checking through my reference, the beans of New York, so I discovered that this bean was called, they called it a Hodson's silver wax bean. The bean in the description is exactly what grew in my garden. And more surprisingly, the history of it talks about that this is a bean that was around the city of Buffalo, New York. So Tuscarora is not far from Buffalo, New York. And Six Nations Reserve is not far from Buffalo, New York. And so, uh, and this is the homeland of the Haudenosaunee people. This is part of our territory. And so later I asked Jiggy, where did you get this bean from? So he got this bean from this old lady in Six Nations who grew it and incorporated it into making cornbread. So she had a little cornbread a factory, and this is the type of bean that she used in her cornbread. Uh, I recently got some more and I planted them out there, uh, in, at Six Nations this year. And my friend who saw them said, wow, see that, well, that was an old fashioned bean that our people used to use a lot of. And I'm really happy that I'm gonna try to regenerate them again. So these are like um, become family tradition, local favorites. And those are things I like to encourage people to do and try. So I think I'm out of time. Nyawe, for listening. Thank you, Steve. Wow, that was magnificent. Oh, my goodness. And you've done triple duty this weekend. So we are so grateful to you and to your time and your history. Um, so this is probably a good time. We can take maybe one or two questions. We want to be able to go into our body break uh, and prepare for our last segment. So if there's any um, one or two questions out there, Lee and I are going to check the, the chat real quick. Let's see if there's anything we may have missed. Um, oh, this is from Ellen. I think this is in your segment, Steve, um, um, Silver Bear. How tall are the bamboo poles in the teepee? Oh, at, at least uh, seven, eight foot or two, 10 foot tall. And I, and I put them in the ground about a foot deep. Okay, excellent. That's what I do. Okay, very good, very good. So um, everyone, we'll give a slightly longer break. Um, we will go on our body break now, and then we will come back at 435, where we will go into a deep dive into ecotype seed work with Sephra Alexandra. So everyone take a break. See you back here at 435.
All right, everyone. Um, as we start to come back, uh, we're going to go into our final uh, session for this wonderful, wonderful day uh, to close out this beautiful seed conference. So we're going to take that deep dive into Echotype seed work, and we uh, bring to the mic, if you will, Sephra Alexandra, who will lead us through this portion. So Sephra, it's all yours. Thank you so much. And um, what an honor and privilege it is to be closing out such an extraordinary conference. It's been such a pleasure to hear from so many friends and colleagues and for everyone doing the great work um, of this important work of working with seeds. So um, we are going to dive into the world of... Dun, dun, dun. ecotypes, ecoregions, and ecological restoration. And if you've never heard of any of those terms, don't worry, we will um, explain all of them. But first, I like to start off by saying, let's just take a collective minute here to marvel at the exquisite, elegant architecture of seeds. They're living embryos um, that are just sleeping and waiting for, for their chance to grow into these beautiful manifestations of the wild lands that are all around us or the amazing bounty of diversity that we get to eat. So it's with that reverence and that respect for seeds that I have done the work that I've been doing for the past decade. I call myself the seed huntress on a hunt to preserve the biodiversity of um, our earth's lands and wilds through the conservation of seed. And that has manifested in many different ways, depending on the global scale that we're talking about. So just as a quick point of reference, a lot of the sessions we've been having today have been talking about um, agricultural or our field crops. And in case some of you out there have never heard of Nikolai Vavilov, the great seed hunter who traveled all around and started to say, hey, these seeds that are different all over, I think these are really important for us to start safeguarding. And um, what he did in his travels was started mapping out what's known as centers of origin. So when we think about our domesticated crops that we eat and we safeguard, they come from a crop wild relative, the tepary bean, teosinte for maize. Um, and what he did is he mapped that out for our world saying where these crops first emerge is where they have greatest amounts of diversity. So that's, or what, as, uh, that's um, what are known as centers of origin. So then our world seed bank, perhaps you've heard of Svalbard, the global seed vault that sits up in Norway and safeguards um, many different countries' seeds collections. Well, what you can see on the map of the gene bank platform is where our world seed banks um, exist, and they exist along centers of origin. So the 150,000 varieties of maize and wheat are held in southern New Mexico, pulses and grains in India, the, agro, the Center for Agroforestry is in Kenya, um, and I was able to do my field work for the Crop Trust on a crop called taro in the South Pacific. I tell you this because often I've, I've heard a couple folks over this conference reference our germplasm repositories. Germplasm is a fancy science word for seeds. But what's important to note is as our climate shift or um, as we want to preserve these gorgeous arcs of diversity, um, it's really important to understand where and how those are stored. So that's myself doing field work, telling the tale of taro, which is the South Pacific's version of the Irish potato famine. Um, a blight wiped out their food crop, which is uh, a keystone in their culture, given in ethnobotanically speaking in rituals of birth and life and death when kings are coronated. And it was all wiped out within six weeks when a blight showed up. And all these seed hunters had to go back out to those centers of origin and regather that genetic diversity um, and rebreed a strain that was both um, blight resistant and tasted good. And so that work started the Taro seed bank, Colocasia esculenta. And so um, that's called ex situ conservation. That means away from the place where those seeds are. So they can be held cool, dark, and dry to be the painter's palette for what needs to be bred in the future. 
And I'm showing you this because the work that we'll talk about is in situ, which means in the soil, which is obviously the best conservation strategy. But in terms of man-made and natural disasters, we can't always keep our seeds in the soil. So we need to understand how they're safeguarded globally. And um, as you can see on the right, this is from my work in the Southern Department of Haiti, an island that experiences lots of natural disasters. And this is called a community seed bank, right? Because not everyone is accessing these global or international seed vaults. And so the best way to have seed sovereignty and have self-facilitated forms of disaster response is to be able to have a community seed bank and safeguarding those seeds that are bioregionally adapted to where you are, like in Southern Haiti. So we worked with um, this beautiful agronomist there to safeguard the seeds that are well adapted to those soils so that the local um, agrarians can access those seeds immediately after a disaster hits and be able to replant their fields um, without a delay, right? So that's in many subsistence farming nations, there's no backup seed supply. It's what's under your bed, it's what you have. So when you can have a community resource like that, um, it does wonders for, building in resiliency. So that's a community seed bank and how the world seed bank functions. And now we're going to start talking. Um, so again, from a global perspective, we currently sit in uh, the UN decade of ecosystem ecosystem restoration. So not to, you know, um, talk about the doom and gloom, but we do see a lot of our wild lands being destroyed, right? Whether it's wildfires or they're being burnt for different um, in industry reasons or, you know, all of the different um, like housing developments that we put on them. We are in a serious situation of having to rewild our corridors of all of this land that's been disturbed. So there's been this global impetus to say, we need to start uh, making sure that we have the native seed, right? The seed that has been on lands undisturbed by, by human influence for a very long time. We need to make sure that we have big stores of that so that when these different um, disruptions happen, we can replant these lands with the right plants in the right place. So what happened from that in 2015 is all these governmental organizations in the United States, they got together and they said, hey, like we have a problem, right? The wildfires out West and in some of these places like in Oregon that we know are just our, our best seed growing lands of our country, just because they have huge amounts of arable lands, they have the machinery, they have all the mechanisms in place. Um, we don't have that in the Northeast. And so um, there's certain parts of our country that have an okay seed supply backed up to be able to reseed after forest fires and so forth, but a lot of our country doesn't. So the national seed strategy was formed as a way to bring all of these different organizations together and say like, all right, we need to figure out how we are going to collect sustainably and regeneratively seeds from the wild and um, grow them out and make sure we have them stored and available for when we need them to be able to replant and ecologically restore our lands. So the Society for Ecological Restoration is a, an amazing resource and they put out um, really great journals that address a lot of these topics. And so they put out a journal that was building standards for native seeds and ecological restoration. Because again, a lot of the seeds we've been talking about, agricultural and horticultural seeds, there's huge regulations around them. When, before you sell them, you need to do germination tests and you need to have all of these different, um, all of these different uh, labeling um, um, details on your seed packets, but predominantly and largely with native seed that, that really hadn't been formulated yet. So what this journal did was tried to make a template that all of these different people working around the globe could use um, to be having the same conversation and make sure when you are buying huge amounts of seed for your project that you're not just buying a bag that won't germinate at all or isn't what you thought that you were um, initially purchasing. So there's a lot of definitions that goes into this work. And um, certainly the word native can be contentious and you know, there's large conversations that can happen around all of these different things that I'm bringing up. But for our purposes here, what we, what we mean by that is um, 
that occur naturally in a particular region, state, or ecosystem and habitat without direct or indirect actions of modern humans, right? Usually since glaciation, as it were. So that's that's kind of the framework that we're working on when we talk about native seeds. Now, a native R, if any of you um, have done the great work of planting pollinators or um, going to nurseries and buying native plants, oftentimes, like we saw with taro, um, when you're in the nursery industry, you're taking cuttings and you're just replanting the exact same genetics because you like the height of a certain plant or the color that it is or some you know, aesthetic attributes of it. And the easiest, quickest way to do that is to take cuttings. But that makes you very susceptible because you're dealing all with one genetic strain. So if something comes along and attacks that, it all gets wiped out. So that's kind of why we um, try and veer against a native R. So the ecotype, which again is the name of the project that I've been leading for the Connecticut chapter of the Northeast Organic Farming Association for four years, um, is referencing the truly local native genetics of place, right? So the plants that have adapted with the pollinators, with the land since time immemorial, that is what we call an ecotype. So it's very locality specific. And again, native plant materials is just like another fancy word for germplasm. It's talking about seeds and it's saying that these are matched their genetic composition is matched with that particular region and that particular location. So they're the most genetically appropriate material for doing the work of restoring the lands, right? When we put our bug eyes on, the pollinators, just like we like to safeguard heirlooms and plant and make sure that they stay in our soils, well, the pollinators and the birds and all, all of the different dispersal, dispersal allies have been doing the same thing with these wild species. So that's what an ecotype is. Um, so what's an ecoregion? Well, a wonderful gentleman at the EPA, he said, if we're truly doing conservation and restoration, we can't go by these man-made delineations of this is where Connecticut is and this is where Massachusetts is. We have to do overlays of all the disparate sciences that work in this arena. So the forestry folks, the ornithology, hydrology, water, right? The, um, you know, the, the, the scientists working with soils and all of these um, different data sets need to be overlaid. So again, when we have our bug eyes on and we're flying over the land, we don't see where state lines are. We see the riparian or the river corridors, the broadleaf forest, we see our coastal areas. And so what the eco-regional map does, and we're working on level three, you can zoom in more that gets more specific and with more funding, it'll be great one day to be able to work at that level. But what we're doing is we're saying, okay, where we sit with the work with Connecticut NOFA, we're in eco region 59. And we know that if we collect seeds um, from within this area, that we can proliferate them along this corridor and know we're putting, genetically speaking, the right plants in the right place. And as Kay Green coined with a seed shed, right? We all talk about our watersheds and bringing in our food sheds. But now let's talk about our seed sheds. Let's make sure that we're collecting, planting, recollecting, and resharing this seed of known provenance, right? We know where it comes from within these seed sheds to really be doing the work of restoration that needs to happen. So just quickly, since this is um, New York NOFA, this is what the level four New York NOFA eco region map looks like. The Hudson Valley, um, there is some of that area that is eco region 59, like where we are in um, most of Connecticut, but you also have 60 and a couple other different ones. So what I'm, I'm going to be talking about and what our whole aim was with the ecotype project was to create a replicable model for each of these eco regions to be able to do the same work of weaving this supply chain together so that each of these eco regions can have um, these locally adapted seeds available um, for the nursery folks and for conservation and restoration. So, and we'll get more into what that seed supply chain looks like, but so um, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank did this great study of all of the folks that use native plants in the East. And what those red dots show you are 
all of the industries and people that want to use ecotypic, truly local seeds, but it's not available, right? For 400 miles away from them. So again, when we brought in our food sheds, now we want to know our nursery men and women, and we want to know where our seeds come from. And we really need to start making this um, an important specialty crop to be grown out because it's not available. So you can see all of these industries, people that work in pollinator support or wildlife habitat um, or habitat restoration, all of them want ecotypes, but again, they're not available. So there's been a lot of other networks formed to address um, the national seed strategy, but that had that work hadn't really been done in a formal way. In the Northeast, there's great folks like Heather McCargo from the um, Wild Seed Project in Maine, some folks out in Long Island. There are amazing people doing this work, but the real supply chain hadn't been woven together. So why would a farming organization care about pollinator health? Well, um, if you can see the photo of those blueberries, the ones on the left have not been properly pollinated and the ones on the right have been. So Dina Brewster, who just stepped down as our executive director, she said, these pollinators are paying our, you, you know, are paying our farmers wages, right? If we don't have the food and habitat on our farm for the pollinators, well, then we don't have local food security for us. So it's a very reciprocal relationship where we need to make sure that we're providing for those that are in this ecological web helping to provide for us. So this work um, has been predominantly funded by the USDA Specialty Crop Block Grant, where the specialty crop is um, teaching seed literacy and teaching seed farmers of the Northeast how to grow ecotypic seed. So how do we do it? Well, we start out by working with botanists, um, trained botanists who go out and wild collect the species that we want to bring into the program. We then work with organic farmers and train them how to grow out 200 plugs. I'll show you pictures of all this, but this is a summary. Um, 200 plugs in what's known as a founder plot. And from those founder plots that produce seed, seed collectors collect it, clean it, and give it to the nursery growers that make these truly local plants available for all of you. And then we can restore our habitats and rewild our corridors um, and do the great work of preserving these amazing plants that have been around us. So let's dive into the botanist a little bit. Um, here's Jordy El Elkins, our main seed collector. He's from Highstead Arboretum in Redding, Connecticut. Now, the important thing about seed collecting is we're not trying to encourage everyone to go out and collect wild seeds because this is a very um, important natural resource. And certainly in our fragmented landscape in the Northeast, there's really not too many places that we can truly go and collect from anymore. So we want to make sure that these seed collectors are trained, that they have permission, that they know what they're looking for, that they know how to only collect a certain percentage of these wild populations. And there's a lot really that goes into it. Um, this is in a Spartina. Hopefully one day we'll bring on the coastal halophytes, the salt tolerant species. But um, so we work predominantly off of what um, a program called the Seeds of Success. So I did um, seed hunting and collecting for the Seeds of Success program out in Idaho, where you truly learn the personalities of these, of these species, where the Primula alkylina grows along the bubbling brook, or the Draba hitchcockii only grows on certain sides of these huge rock faces and, you know, the largest rattlesnake territories of a five-mile hike in. So the regions of these plants are so specific. And so through that, you learn to take the herbaria, you take dried um, plant species to make sure it's safeguarded in the Smithsonian and other areas for reference. And you take all this passport data because, okay, there's the Mona Lisa taking a selfie, but just like we care about where art comes from, let's have that same reverence for where our seeds come from because it's really important to be able to track that to both match it with the most appropriate location that it will go to, um, but also know what um, areas that we've preserved these um, arcs of diversity from. So the Millennium Seed Bank in Kew Gardens, that's in um, England, they are the seed bank that safeguards all these wild species because as these areas become more dry and arid, um, 
there was a, there was this impetus behind making sure that we had a seed bank that was specifically focused on that. So that's Mecca. I hope to go there one day. So when we're thinking about what species we wanted to bring onto the program, we wanted to make sure that we were thinking about bloom times, right? Because we need to make sure that we're providing food and habitat for these pollinators all throughout the seasons. We can't just feed them for one part, like uh, this 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 great woman who I heard talk, she said, it's like inviting house guests over for a week and only feeding them on Monday. You have to feed them all throughout the week. So we need to make sure that the bloom times span from early spring to midsummer to early fall all throughout. So again, this is from the Wild Seed Project. Um, if you want the most beautiful publications that makes all of these uh, topics really digestible and fun to learn about, uh, they do a wonderful job. So here's just a brief list of some of the species we've brought into our seed production program. We have actually now a few different asters, a few different milkweeds. We have the Joe pie weed and the New York ironweed. We have the penstemon, the, the foxglove beard tongue, the cardinal flowers, the monkey flowers, the bergamots, just beautiful, beautiful flowers. And they really like the, the symphony of ecology when, when, when all of these plants are growing in these founder pots is just astounding. I didn't know bugs that I see even existed. You just, you can't believe the diversity. It's so fun and really fun to be out there with kids. And here's our black eyed Susan. And these are um, Jean and Abby who are the head farmers at the hickories. And they said, where are the pollinators on the black eyed Susan? So one night they put their red headlamps on and they went out at night and they said, night pollinators. So again, when we're thinking about the species, we don't just want to think about bloom times throughout the season, but also throughout the day, right? Um, so here's a couple more of the species that we've been working with. And <clears throat> so the, the way the process works, um, <clears throat> this again is at the Hickories in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And this is what our founder plots look at look like. So from the seeds that our seed collector collects in the wild, we grow out at least 200 plugs and we plant them in a row like you would any other row crop, like you'd grow your tomatoes or your cucumbers and so forth. But again, we're growing for the specialty crop of seed. And so you saw ex situ seed banks, right? Away from place. So this is in situ, in the soil. And this means it can be adapting with what's going on with the climate and what's, you know, um, our local pollinators and very vigorous, very alive seeds. And um, we're able to then collect the F1 generation, that first generation that came from those wild seeds, because it is indeed, and it's a good thing, illegal to directly sell seeds collected from the wild. There has to be an amplification process um, that protects, again, that natural resource. So, you know, again, so we started out with the doom and gloom, but the ROI of seed my friends, is so encouraging because you plant one and the next year you have thousands. And so from these founder plots, I'll show you, we're collecting millions of seeds. And it's really encouraging to know that we can caretake and help steward these lands and be able to provide so much um, on our farms for our pollinators and ultimately, again, providing local food security for us. So here's just some of the farmers that we brought onto the program. And again, I hope this is just um, an inspiration to replicate this in whatever eco region you're in. But um, we've worked with farmers from all over Connecticut and um, especially um, this great uh, urban farm in New Hallville. And the urban environment is um, amazing for seed production because with these native species, you wanna make sure you have isolation distances from other wild populations that could have showed up from who knows where when they are planted. So the urban areas often provide a great buffer for seed production, knowing that you're safeguarding the genetics that you're planting. And there's this um, great study that hasn't come out yet, but I heard her speak, this woman in Germany, who was talking to the efficacy of how much, um, because you don't find 200 plugs of these native plants usually that close together in the wild, that this is actually increasing the amount of diversity. And so when we're doing our seed collections, we're making sure we're collecting as much as possible. And um, it's actually increasing the arcs of diversity that we have from those founder plots. So at the end, I'll take questions and I hope I'm not um, just going too fast or speaking too much, but um, it's, 
there's just a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So for these farmers, right, because a lot of the farmers in the Northeast, unlike the Midwest and other parts where um, there's a lot of farmers who are very familiar being contracted as seed growers, but that's not really as common now. And with the great work with that, that Heron and everyone with this conference has done really bringing the conversation from the West Coast OSA to this coast, that, that's really starting to change. And there's so many great seed companies here with um, Petra and True Love and on and on and on, everyone who's spoken. But um, what we've done is we've created this getting started toolkit. So for these farmers who want to come on the program and say, we've never grown perennials, we've never grown crops for seed. Well, in that little tin box or for free on our website as PDFs, we have what the general growing protocols are that you need to think about, the general seed saving protocols you need to think about, what you need to think about when you're growing um, these rows for multi-years. And also, uh, as we're creating this community of practice, there's logs so you can uh, make comments and make observations about how your plot's going and what was good and what was bad so we can all learn and improve these cards together. And then so for each of the different species, we make a species specific card that tells you um, what soil it wants to be planted in, what beneficial insects that you can um, you know, think to see and just some characteristics of these different species. Um, and again, these are all free downloadable PDFs at the Ecotype Project website. And I have um, a resource sheet that will be put in the chat um, at the end that you can uh, access these through. So let's talk about the seeds. So just like fruits, right? Your entire row of tomatoes, they don't all turn red at the same time. Well, it's the same thing with seed. As you can see, this is the Joe Pie weed. And that fluffy part, that seed that's ready to collect. Those flowers that are still a little bit tight, not ready to collect. So what we'll do, because we wanna leave the stalks on these plants as high as possible. It's like the Miami condos for the pollinators. They need to overwinter in there. So we don't wanna cut them off. Um, we shake the seeds into these brown paper bags. You don't wanna fill them up too much because you're gonna put those brown paper bags in an area where you let the seeds desiccate, dry out, lose their water content before we go on to clean them. Also, you just break the seeds apart. But we'll go through starting with um, the plants that go to seed earliest because we want to capture whatever brilliant genetics are in the seeds that are going to seed earliest all the way through that big chunk when most of your row is going to be ready all the way to the the flowers that go to seed last because um unlike uh, you know, traditional row crops where you need to know that in 60 days, it'll be ripe when, when you have a CSA or market garden with, with the wild plants, we just want to trust that their intelligence, you know, we want to make sure we're capturing all of it because wherever these seeds go, maybe that is the right genetics for that place. So we collect these seeds and we go back through these rows quite a few times throughout the season. This is the beautiful New York ironweed. It's a good one for this conference. Um, and you can see like those little pom-poms in the center. They're not quite there yet, but the ones on the right, when you can easily pull off the seed, if you think about natural dispersal mechanisms, a lot of the ones we're seeing would use wind, anamakori, right? Fancy word for wind dispersal. That's when you know that those seeds are truly ripe and when they, when they easily come off. Um, and the back side of those cards, right? Because if any of you have ever seed collected, especially out in the wilds, you're like, is that the seed? Is that the seed? I don't know. Maybe that's the seed. It's a little confusing. So this shows you relative size, what it looks like. And then you can see that fluffy part that's called a pappus. And that's what allows it to float away, right? This um, lets you know what they look like and about what time of year you can expect these stands to um, go to seed and so forth. So after we've collected our seed, um, here's the Joe Pye weed. You can see what that looks like going to seed as well. That one on the bottom right, little too long, little moldy. Let's leave that for the birds and let's not collect that, right? So there is a fine line of what you want to be collecting and not. Um, here's the Penstemon digitalis has quite a strong, um, interesting odor to it, but just a beautiful flower. Um, and these little pods, you'd be amazed. There's like so many in each of those little pods, but the germination rate on them is quite low. So nature's smart. They're like, our germination rate is low. We're going to make a million. 
So um, these are definitely behave very differently than, uh, you know, our traditional orthodox, the, the, the horticultural seeds or the um, agricultural seeds that we're used to. Orthodox is just a fancy word for seeds that can dry out and desiccate. Think your peppers, your tomatoes, the ones in the seed packet. Um, just for reference, when I was working in the South Pacific, those, a lot of those plants in more tropical areas are recalcitrant meaning their botanical seed, you can't dry it out. It loses its viability. So you do have to preserve the genetics through little cuttings. Um, that's for another story though. But just so you know the difference, these are orthodox seeds, those are recalcitrant. So um, then we get to go through the fun mission of cleaning the seed, right? You wanna make sure again that they're desiccated and dried out, but this is just a simple cheap car mat. These sieves that a lot of the soil scientists use work really great. Go to the dollar store and buy every size you can, and you just have to experiment for home use. If you're not, you know, starting a seed company with this, you can just reseed these with the Papasan, no problem. But for our uses in supporting um, uh, the nurseries and a commercial seed company, we needed to get them clean. So we're removing the Papas and um, taking all that plant material, all those stalks off. And to do this at a larger scale, Bill Braun, who's on the call, he also has one of these amazing machines, the Winnow Wizard, which um, a wonderful farmer out on Frank Morton's farm in Oregon was sick of using the clipper machines. And so he invented this amazing machine that you can drop your seeds down through the hopper, modulate your airflow. Um, and so what that does is it winnows the chaff and the pappas away after you rubbed it, and it drops the seeds down into these bins below. Um, so currently CT NOFA has this Winnow Wizard available to any of its members to try and encourage these seed sheds and bioregional hubs of um, collectively building our seed literacy and wanting to, even if it's one crop on your farm, learn how to save your seeds. So the Winnow Wizard has been fantastic. And after all of that, ta-da, we had, okay, Eco Region 59. Ecotypic, organically grown, native pollinator seed available. Yay, I can hear hopefully some cheers because it really was um, a lot of work and a concerted effort of many people. And it shows that we all have a seat at the table from the conservationists and botanists and farmers and nursery growers that we all need to work together to reweave these seed supply chains. So from that, um, Eco 59, a farmer led seed collective. So, CT Nova's nonprofit, Eco 59 farmer led seed um, collective is for profit. And Dina Brewster of the Hickories, again, now she's leading that. And what that is, is that makes sure that the our seed farmers who are in the program actually have a market, a guaranteed buyer for their seeds. And we have to go through the process of helping to clean them. Um, getting them germ tested, packaging them, and getting a seed seller's license and all of those fun things. So um, Eco59, again, that website's going to be on my resource page, but they have all sorts of fun things like seed balls, like Fukuoka style with um, the slingshots. If you don't want to plant seeds, there's mugs and cards and all these things to support the farmers who are in this program. And this box right here is an absolute paradigm shifting game changer. Native seeds need to go through what's known as stratification. I'll go back to this. Oh, where's the slide? Okay, we moved it. Um, so they have to go through stratification. You have to mimic what happens in nature, right? So out in the wilds, these seeds blow off your native plants. They fall into the soil. And then there's rain, freeze, thaw, snow, rain, sun, right? all of that. And that's what those seeds are um, adapted to have to go through to be able to germinate. So if you want your native seeds to grow, you have to mimic that. Oftentimes people put them in um, a moist, not wet paper towel in your fridge and you label it for 30 or 60 or 90 days, depending on species. And then you can plant them out and grow them out. The better way to do it, and there's an image in here somewhere that shows, is you just sow them back out into this um, with the seed starter and the worm compost tray, and you just lock it so that birds and mice and so forth don't eat it, and you just put it outside, and you let nature do its thing, and then come spring, you start to see all these little babies, and it's the most economical, easiest, best way to be working with these um, species. 
So, and then you can up pot them and then plant them out. And your success rate is going to be a lot better than just broadcast seeding. So Eco 59 uh, is really amazing and um, is the first, you know, seed company other than Wild Seed Project and a few others that has these eco-regionally appropriate ecotypic seeds for sale. So really amazing. Um, and again, then these seeds go to our nursery partners. We've been working a lot with Planner's Choice. Daryl Newman's been awesome, who makes these um, locally provenanced plugs at a wholesale level available so that when restoration projects need to buy these plugs, they know again that they're putting the right plants back in the right place. So really exciting work. Um, and ecological restoration, right? We, we all have this role to play to make sure that we're safeguarding these beautiful plants that are around us. And so um, by helping to weave together this supply chain wherever you are, you know that you can be helping to safeguard these wild areas and these wild corridors for all of these, the amazing diversity of all of these beings that rely on it. It's not, you know, there's the successional webs that, you know, all fauna come from these wild plants, right? Um, so let's do our part to reweave the web. And here is slightly out of place, that stratification diagram that I wanted to show you all. So this just says, again, Heather McCargo, Wild Seed Project. She's just sowing the seeds. You even put a little bit of sand on top. Some native seeds need a little bit of light. You put the netting over it. You leave it outside to the elements and ta-da. Sometimes people use you know, milk jugs like this. You cut them open. You leave the top off so it can gather moisture. There's a million YouTube videos on on doing winter sewing. So look up winter sewing if you want to do that. Um, so kind of as we get to the end, so I can take some questions here, I wanted to inspire people who might not otherwise be interested in this type of work um, to the fact that this is, this is work that is fun and possible by all of us. So I started Botanical Expeditions where I say I'm not a botanist, I'm a botanist. And we paddled along riparian corridors um, uh, especially over the past few years along the Connecticut River, which is um, the traditional Algonquin term for the Long Tidal River that goes all the way up from the headwaters just over the border in Canada, all the way down to the Long Island Sound. And we paddled um, down these rivers with these plants. And, you know, you're reminded that these are these, you know, great um, pathways and transit ways that that the insects and the animals and the humans have been using for so long. So if we can do our part to put these plants back in these living seed banks in the soil, well, then nature knows how to do the rest, right? Um, a couple more fancy words, mermockery, mer dispersal of seed by ants, ornithockery, dispersal of seed by birds, hydrockery, dispersal of seed by water, um, zoockery by animal, right? And anthropockery by humans. So we all have this amazing role to play to work with nature rather than against it and stand in as stewards. Uh, as a great mentor, Bill McDormand, who I know a lot of you here have studied with and worked with, um, he says, you know, we're the people of the pinch at a pinch in time in the history of our biodiversity when we can either watch it erode away or we can stand in as stewards and caretakers. And, um, it's really been a beautiful thing. And I, uh, I've carried a flag for Wings World Quest, which supports women in science. And um, it's really wonderful to get people excited. And the same with the Ecotype Project. Uh, my hope with Botanical Expeditions is to say that to do this type of work, you don't have to get on an airplane and go far away. You can do it right in your own backyard. So what can we do to ecologically restore and help share these, um, these plants right where they need to be. So um, two years ago now, we again, this was the Connecticut section. We took an outrigger, traditional outrigger canoe, and we went down and hiked through the forest with our plants and planted another founder plot at one of these farms along the river. And um, it's just so fun. And there's beautiful places everywhere. So 
Um, oh, and then this was right in Connecticut. We did some invasive species removal to make room for these native plants. You can see a mile a minute everywhere on an island that was gonna be turned into a 14 story nuclear power plant and was saved from that catastrophe. And now I'm working to, to save it from this one. So um, these resources are all in uh, a document that will be put in the chat. And with about five minutes or so left, I would love to help answer any questions after I'm sure a tidal wave of information, <laughs> but um, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sephra. Wow, what it was wonderful information and beautiful work. So at this time, if there are any um, questions that are in the chat, Lee and I will scour the chat now to see if there are any questions that came up. Um, a lot of uh, thanks um, to the to all of our panelists for um, such wonderful presentations today. Now, Renee had a question. Uh, Sephra, do you work with the Sami Native Plant Trust in Mass? And do you ever speak to university classes? She teaches at the Stockbridge School of Agriculture at UMass Amherst. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, you want to know what? I think I missed one of my slides. I'm going to go back. I think you all can see that. Okay. Yeah, I did. Um, so the Native Plant Trust, I'm part of um, a really amazing group of colleagues that is working to really formalize a Northeast um, Seed Network that we will be launching and announcing at the Native Seed Conference, which will be in Alexandria, Virginia, March 27th to the 30th. Um, and we've been working really closely with um, the Native Plant Trust and a whole bunch of other really great organizations, the um, Ecological Health Network. Eve Allen has been a huge supporter. Um, so that's really exciting. So look out for that. And as well as um, Uli Lorimer from Native Plant Trust and Eve Allen from the Ecological Health Network will be talking at the West Cheshire Community College Spring Landscape Conference, which is March 13th. So um, if you want to hear more about the networks that are being formed, that's a really great opportunity. Um, again, if you're looking for plants that are appropriate, especially if you're in the Hudson Valley, look at Tiny Meadow Farm. Um, Shannon Siegel, who um, has been a great ally of the whole Northeast Seed Network, she's wonderful. And Eco 59, of course, which is the seed collective, and then Planter's Choice, which is the wholesale nursery. And yes, I love speaking to um, students of all ages. So um, please be in touch. All right. And Sharon asks, will there be a panel again this year? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Paddle every year. Um, so botanical.org. Um, you can be in touch with me that way. And um, I really wanted to do some, I, I, ha I have some very, I have some good ideas for this next paddle. Still, still formulating. But yes, please be in touch. All right. All right. Well, wow, this has been a, a spectacular afternoon. The morning was out of sight, and this is really a great way to end a beautiful day and a beautiful conference. So in these last um, few minutes um, for, for the hope for the uh, presenters, they're still with us. And we're talking about Donna, Jillian, um, if Silver Bear is still here. And of course, Sephra, are there any closing remarks that you would like to have? And if there are any additional questions, we can take those at this time. Well, again, thank all of you for putting on such a, a wonderful conference. I know how much work goes into that. And um, just one other story that comes to mind, again, Bill McDormand, who teaches seed school. So for anyone who really wants to dive deeper into learning from nuts to acorn to oak tree about the seed world, um, that's a really wonderful resource. But he would take his cell phone in one hand and a seed in the other, and he would say, which has greater intelligence? He would say, the seed, you know, <laughs> ever adapting, ever changing. So let's, um, yeah, if we all do our part in safeguarding them, um, they know what to do from there. That's right. They do. They do very well. Very well put. Uh, Jillian um, or Donna, did you have any closing remarks? All I can say is just Hi, everyone. Grow. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks to everybody for putting things on and 
really nice to learn from everybody. And uh, Sephra and I did meet many years ago with the people of The Pinch. So happy to see you again. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for putting things on. And I never saved tomato seeds in February. So that was a good chance to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed to work well too. So th thank you, Jillian. Uh, Donna, go right ahead. You had some closing remarks. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you everyone for coming and grow the seeds and save the seeds and get out in the sun and play in the dirt. Nothing's better. Many thanks for that. That was right on time. And uh, he's probably going to get mad for, for me doing this, but I do want to not only thank our wonderful presenters uh, throughout the whole conference, uh, particularly today's session. But I also want to give a big shout out to Heron Green, who did a lot of the organizing behind the scenes. Um, we definitely want to give him much love. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to him. He asked me to come every time this conference comes, comes on. So I'm very grateful to him. So yes, let's show much love to Heron for that hard work behind the scenes of pulling this together. And also big love to NOFA New York once again for allowing us to use this platform. So if there's nothing else, Lee, I didn't know if you had any closing comments for the for the rest of the folks. No, just um just thank you so much for being here. And again, thank you, Heron, for holding this space for all of us. All right. All right. Well that being said, please um can't wait till it warms up so we can go out and play in the soil. But everyone um go back, see the videos that are up on socio. They many of them are ready. This one will be up pretty soon. And look forward to more information coming from the Northeast Seed group. So be well and uh, thank you for your time. And it's been an honor to work with you all again this year. So be well, everyone. Bye bye.